yes, obviously I was I was ecstatic that the team got to the final and uh, got to the finals, qualified. I mean, in such like unbelievable circumstances as well. Um, but it is tinged. There's a, so you, you're really happy about it from that element, but there's a part of you that's like that's a bit deflated by it because you want to be part of it, and you're you're essentially you're je- you're jealous of people doing what you used to be able to do and you can't do it anymore. Welcome to another edition of Across the Line. It's Football Friday and we've got a real heavy hitter on the program today. One of the rare perks of being on quarantine is we get an opportunity to reach out to people who are in far flung places. Places like England. Today, joining us from the UK is none other than Ascal's legend, Rob Gear captain of the squad and part of the icon, iconic hmm, 2010 Suzuki Cup squad that made all kinds of history for the Philippines. He takes us through his entire football lane journey, making it as a schoolboy all the way to the pros with Wimbledon, everything in between, and making it into the Ascals all the way through his coaching journey that he's on right now. It's a fantastic episode and we really get to dig really deep into him and his footballing career. So I hope you enjoy the show as much as I did being a part of this conversation. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast uh, and the content that we provide here on Across the Line, please do subscribe to the show on YouTube, on uh, Apple Podcasts, and over on Spotify as well, whichever one you prefer. Of course, don't forget to rate and review and share with a friend. Without further ado, on this Football Friday, we've got Rob Gear. Enjoy. With us on the program today is one of the ASCAS legends, a true great of the Philippine national team, Rob Gear, former captain and longtime servant, and uh, really a part of the, the generation that, that, that grew the national team into prominence. Hey, Rob, how's it going? Um, how you doing over there? Hey, Jing. Hey, Chrissy. Um, yeah, all right, man. Like, uh, we're, we're in a similar situation to you guys. We're, we're, we're locked down here in the UK, uh, so kids are off school. So, doing a bit of homeschooling at the moment, so that's quite interesting. Um, but yeah, it's great. Thanks for having me on, guys, because it's really, I, I've really, I've been listening to the show a lot. You guys have done some really good content and, um, yeah, kind of keeping me company on my drive ins to work in the morning. So, great work you guys are doing. Hey, Chrissy, how you doing, mate? Yeah, yeah I'm good. It's been, uh, it's been a long time coming. We, we wanted to get you on the show before, but, um, circumstances dictated that we weren't able to uh, meet. But now, obviously, with everyone has having a bit more free time on their hands, it's a perfect opportunity to get you on the show. And uh, there's been a real fervor of excitement um, when we announced it, I think, on Wednesday. Uh, I know we've, we've got a lot of people from the public have, uh, have been in touch and I've got a few questions for you. So um, we'll make sure we try to get to those questions as we uh, progress through the interview. And then if anyone has any questions during the course of the interview, please... Um, during the Facebook Live interview, send it over and we'll endeavour to do our best to get them over to Rob. But um, yeah, before we get sort of into the nitty gritty of Rob Gear, you know, as, as we know him, what, what are you up to at the moment, Rob? What's, uh, what's taking up most of your time in the football world? Um, yeah, before all this kind of kicked off, um, so I'm academy manager uh, um, down at Reading uh, Women's Football Club. Um, so basically I'm responsible for um, girl, the girls' programme that, so from kind of 17 up to our first team, essentially, like our de- development squad team that leads into our first team. So I oversee that programme. We've, we've, got, we've got about 24, 25 girls on the programme. Um, so they do their education alongside their football. We kind of manage the whole thing, the whole package. So we're all on the site, same site together. Um, we're based at the school where the, where the girls educate. Their timetable's built around their football. Um, train with them six days a week essentially we do Monday to Friday and then Saturday's off and then we, we have a training session on the Sunday as well um, so yeah flat out mate, mate with all that it's I've been doing it this is well the end of my second season there now I love it it's great the, group, the girls are brilliant the staff around me are great um, we've got I think three or four full-time members of staff including myself um, just involved with the academy um, yeah, and it's brilliant. The school are great. The the, the girls are, are fantastic. The the amount of effort and stuff that they put in all the time to 
to their studies and to you know s and c to their training to their individual stuff is just it's quite inspirational really it drives us on to make sure that we can produce the best we can for them when we're when we're doing our bits and pieces on the coaching field I know that last year um I mean you guys had a pretty successful season uh, some um so yeah good 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 cup run didn't you last year last year mm-hmm. before, last year right um, last year. yeah I mean obviously reading as a it's sort of geographically just if you want to explain that you're in kind of close proximity to London but you're kind of a little bit out the way uh a little bit obviously the men's team have been in recent years been in the Premier League but have found themselves kind of in the championship uh, over the last few seasons um but I know your women's academy is, is particularly strong and, and you've been able to compete with some of the more traditional um powerhouse clubs big name clubs that are you know worldly renowned so um yeah just tell us a little bit about how successful your your pro because I think you've undersold it a little bit I think you've done a you've done a really good job judging by some of the results against some you know pretty big name teams in in recent seasons yeah I mean like in terms of women's football this is slightly different from the men so our girls our, our first team our women's first team compete in the WSL which is the top league um in the UK for women um and we're generally finishing around fourth fifth most seasons you know we're kind of you've got your your bigger teams if you like your bigger teams so your man cities chelsea's arsenal is the ones that are always going to compete at the top and then we're kind of vying for the best of the rest at the moment to be honest um in terms of our first team um we've they've been punching above their way for a long time actually the first team so and we're in a similar situation with the with the academy as well so yeah you're right geographically we're i mean we're technically just outside london um, Reading's uh, a town about what about an hour and a hour outside of London, something like that, roughly. Um, so yeah, we're competing with Arsenal, Chelsea in terms of our recruitment pool and the area where we can recruit from. Southampton's not a million miles away from us. Um, they've got a really, you know, just a good academy set up in terms of their boy side of things, um, how their facilities are and stuff. So we're competing with them a little bit as well. Bristol are just down the road. So, you know, we're, quick, we're in an area where we're trying to compete for uh, recruiting the best girls. Um, thankfully, over the last couple of seasons, we, you know, results on the pitch have been pretty good. Um, like you say, we, we had a decent cut run last year. We, we didn't do as well this year. We let ourselves down a little bit, but we finished... Well, I say finish, well, the season finished a couple of weeks ago. We were second behind Chelsea. Um, we finished a joint second last year as well. Um, so, you know, we, results-wise, we're doing OK. It's more about getting players, obviously, through to the first team. And we've had we've had two two girls that have made appearances for our first team this year, which has been great. Um, another not, I think we've had about six girls that have actually been involved with the first team, so on the bench in, in like WSL games, which has been good. So it shows the progression is there in terms of program. Um, I think we've got six, six or seven internationals this year we had competing at their age group. So either for England under 19s, under 18s, um, Ireland under 19s as well. So, you know, the program as a whole is, is pretty good. It's ticking along quite nicely at the minute. We're just, um, you know what it's like though, mate. You're only as good as the cohort that you've got as well. Mm. Um yeah. We were lucky and we've been blessed the last couple of years that our cohort's been really, really good. And we've managed to, with the help of the coaching staff, we've managed to mould them into to a pretty competitive team um, year on year. So, fingers crossed, you know, the situation at the moment is going to have an impact on how we recruit for next year. Um, you don't even know when that's going to start yet. But, um, you know, hopefully we'll be there or thereabouts again next year. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's I know, great. I know, I know, Jing, you're 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 really big into the um the women's football scene here, aren't you? I mean, you're you're uh you know one of those voices that really tries to champion the the women's game as much as possible. I mean, we only we had um Ina Palacios, who is the academy uh, goalkeeper and also the women's national team goalkeeper and captain. Um, we recorded her episode this week. She yeah. the episode actually dropped today. Um. I mean, obviously, a lot of things, Gene, that you and I talk about, right, with with the women's game in terms of trying to develop it and escalate it as much as possible. And, it, and it's great to have someone, obviously, of Rob's calibre who's played at, you know, played at a high level, um, imparting his knowledge with um, within the girls' game because it's certainly a, a game that's that's growing rapidly in the UK and and, and obviously it, throughout the globe. Yeah, is, is that something that is um, translating over in England as well? Like because 
obviously the women's game is strangely dominated by the United States, which is um, uh, something completely different from what you know the men's game is. Um, are there specific efforts being done uh, in England or in the UK that um, uh, it revolves around pushing the, the women's game further along? Oh yeah, it's 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 massive at the moment, right? It's it's um, you know the amount of, of of effort that the the FA are putting into it in particular. So it is it's a requirement by every top team, a bit similar to the men, um, that everyone in the top division has an academy that runs alongside it. So it, we call it a dual career pathway for the girls. So you know they're pushing it from from that point of view, but. The amount of CPD stuff we've had um, from the FA where we're talking about how we can further push the girls on physically to, to kind of, and you're right, it's the Americans are the benchmark for everything. So a lot of a lot of the metrics that, that the FA use and that they pass down to us is how can we get the girls from here where they are currently to be able to compete against these guys and, and ultimately win the World Cup for, for the women's side of things is what they obviously want to do. Um so that there's so much information that there's cross sharing between the club. So all our GPS data and stuff, we kind of, we, we, we have metrics and stuff that the F, the FA are passed down to us that we try and make sure our girls can hit. So when they go away with England or, you know, just to have them around us as well, but when they go away with England, that they're, they're at a certain level um, physically where they can, they can compete. Um, you know, everything is geared towards the women's game at the moment is massive over here it, and it's, it's only going to get bigger. Um, and to be fair to the FA, they backed it. They backed it really well. They've um, they're, they're keeping us in constant contact with us as, as a club to make sure we're um, we're, all, we're all on the same page and we're looking to hit the same metrics that they want to hit. Um, yeah, it's, it is all geared towards, I mean, you know, I, I our women's team, they got to the semi-finals, didn't they, in the World Cup? Lost them, obviously, to America. Um, now that we were looking to go one stage further next time, um, you know, whatever's going to happen with the Olympics now, I know it's going to be next year, but that was the next big thing. Um, so it's constantly trying to start, strive and, and make sure the players are, are exposed to as much physical contact and technical contact as we possibly can in these, these development years. So in a couple of years, we should see the fruition come through. Um, start to see girls coming through and, and all, the, all the hard work that the clubs are doing pay off for England as well. You mentioned something. CPD. What is that? Sorry. Um, continue professional development. So just basically furthering your, your understanding mm. of, yeah, of, of your job, basically. Essentially. I see. I mean, I, it seems like your, your enthusiasm for the game uh, has not dwindled uh, even a little bit. <laughs> coaching the women's game at an academy level as well. At the moment, um, a lot of people are interested to know about your license situation. You currently hold a UEFA A or UEFA Pro. What, what is it that you're holding at the moment? I've got UEFA A. I've got my UEFA A. Um, I do the same, 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 um, same course as Chrissy, um, who actually put me in touch with the guys down o over in Ireland to, to get on that course. Um, the plan was that this year I was going to apply to go on my pro. Um, now everything's obviously all up in the air. Like I think applications for the pro came, come out in, they do it every two years. So um, I had to wait till this year before I could try and apply for it. Um, all being well, I would like to try and apply for it this, this kind of August time. And then however long that takes to complete, uh, I think it's a year, a couple of years, Chrissy, if I'm wrong. I'm yeah. Wrong. Sounds so, about right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so, That'll be the next stage. I, I've done my A. I, I got it a couple of years back now, and I wanted. I didn't want to just be one of those guys that kind of jumps on and gets gets their badges as quickly as they possibly can. I wanted to kind of have my A. I, I, I kind of knew that that was my level right now. Um, but I feel uh, I've done. I've been academy manager now for a couple of years. I've been coaching for more than that now. I feel like I'm ready for the next stage. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hopefully jump on that and and then see where that takes me. What about you, Chris? When are you, when are you doing your pro license? I was hoping to do it at the same time as Rob. So uh, oh, yeah. I, have, I have a pal to do it with. Yeah, I know it's, um, I've got a couple of little bits and pieces I need to finish off with my A license. All like my coursework and stuff is all done. Um, I've just got to do my final assessment, which 
I don't want to sound arrogant, but it should be a formality, really. Uh, just got to do the video and then send it off. Um, but like like Rob said, if we can't get on the grass, it might be it might take a little bit of time. That's literally the last thing I've got to do. Uh, been in contact with the staff coaches, the same guys who Rob had been with. So it's just, um, yeah, I'm hoping to get that completed in the next, yeah, hopefully next month or two, we can get back on on the grass. But um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I think the A license now is 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 a great license to have. But if you have aspirations of being a top top level manager. Uh, or, or coach at any kind of, uh, you know, top tier league, top tier club, top tier academy, whatever. You, you need that pro license. So, um, yeah. And if you if you're serious about your coaching career, which obviously Rob and I are, then at some stage you're gonna have to um, you're gonna have to get on that course. So yeah, whether it's this year for Rob, great. Um, if not, maybe defer for a year. Maybe we jump on it together and see how we get on. Um, Every two wits. years, though, Chrissy, you're gonna have to wait. Yeah, no, that's fine. Year, yeah, I, I might just chuck my CV in in there anyway and see what they say. <laughs> they'll, hopefully, they'll they'll make some concessions. But um, yeah, I mean, li- listen, like 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 um, Jing was alluding to, you know, it's great to see. Listen, you're always enthusiastic about, um, you know, imparting your knowledge with your fellow teammates, with younger players. Um, you know, it's great to see that you you've still got that enthusiasm when you go into coaching. Um, but I think for now, I want to just park that a little bit and and sort of go back into Rob Gear, the player, many many moons ago. Um, you know, you got some some memorabilia on the wall behind you there, which uh, huh. obviously some some of your some of your seminal moments from from your playing sure. career. But I know a lot of the people who listen to this podcast are parents <clears throat> or they're young aspiring players, and uh, often when we we do these interviews, the, the most interesting aspect for me is obviously finding out how people um, either got their break in football or, you know, what was it like for them kind of coming up through the ranks. So um, I want to sort of take you back to the beginning, really, and, and find out what what did the start of the, of the Rob Gear footballing career look like? How, how did you first get introduced to the game? Was it through your parents? Was it through playing in, in the school playground with your mates? How did, how did you initially get into the game? Oh, cool, Boise, that's a long time ago now. Um, it would have been just through my old man, to be honest. My dad yeah. was, um, he was, he was never any good at football, my old man, but he was, he was, he was really enthusiastic. He supported Liverpool as a, as a, you know, as a youngster. He still does support Liverpool. Um, so we just used to go down the park. I've got uh, my earliest memories of me and him just, just having a kick around down the park. I used to wait for him on the, He'd get back from a flipping full day slog at work and then I'd be waiting ready. I'd say, come on, and let's go down the park. And it would be, we'd play three goals and in and swap over. He'd be the goalie, I'd be on out pitch and then we'd swap over and he'd go in goal. And yeah, they, they were my youngest, kind of my earliest memories really of the game. Um, he then took me down to my local team, which was Ascot United at the time. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what age I started playing there. I think I was pretty late, to be honest. It wasn't, he would be able to tell you more, obviously. I think I must have been eight, something like that. So really? I know, yeah. Yeah. quite late. Yeah, it would have been it would have been quite late. Um any reason so yeah, just stop uh, I don't know really. I don't I don't really know. Um yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't I don't really know. I don't know. Because because um, I, I I have this conversation, Rob, with a lot of parents, because obviously uh, I don't know if you've seen the documentary No Hunger in Paradise, but you know, there, there seems to be uh, a race for a lot of parents at the bottom to get their kids into academies in the UK, for example, as early as they can. Uh, I, I see it, obviously, in, in academies here. I mean, look, I'll be honest. We have kids aged, you know, two, three that are in my academy. Look, I'm not trying to breed them as professional footballers by any stretch of the imagination, but... I definitely think that there are a lot of parents who have their eye on whether it be a, getting a scholarship if you're here potentially, or um, can you try and get them to a school abroad using their footballing talents? And, and you're talking about kids that are five, six, seven years of age. Um, but a lot of the conversations that we've had with people who've come on the show, it's it's more often than not they just play recreational football until the sort of later on in their formative years. So I was wondering. Until you went to Ascot United at say seven, eight years old, were you doing other activities? Were you doing other sports? What, what other things were you doing? Um, you, you, you seem quite. A, I'd, I'd assume you were quite an active kid growing up. Uh, yeah, so quite active. Things? I mean, uh, um, I wouldn't. I, I would. I didn't try. You know, I, I, there was other things I tried. I tried judo for a little while and little bits and pieces like that. But it was all. It was really all football for me. 
Yeah. Um, I don't know why I just didn't join a join a team any earlier than that. I mean, I've heard you guys speak on here before about about these kind of formative years and stuff. And um, so I've got my Joseph, my youngest. He's he's five years old now, <clears throat> and I haven't really done any too much football stuff with him at the moment. Mm. It's almost like my mini experiment, really, to see like. So at the moment he does. Mine's, mine's the opposite. I haven't played him every day, and I'm bullying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so like, yeah. So with JJ at the minute, he does. He does, um, he does like a dance class. Um, he does a parkour class. Mm. Um, and I just, the, the idea behind that, I just want him to kind of get used to how his body moves. I want him to understand how his, you know, what, what it's like to balance on one leg and move the other leg at the same time, you know, or do a star jump or, do you know what I mean? You'd be amazed at the amount of kids that can't do all this, this kind of stuff. So to then to chuck, yeah. them, to chuck them straight into playing football and say, I want you to do this solely and is I'm just trying to do it a slightly different way. I'm going to introduce into football a little bit later. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're, I mean, different people are different, aren't they? I mean, it is, there is a lot to be said about um, ability when you're older to exposure and how that kind of links through and, and mm-hmm. the amount of exposure you need to, to become some of the top players and stuff. But, you know, if a kid can't, if a kid can't hop on one leg and you're asking them to go and, to straight away and play football that's uh, you know I, th- I think there's other things surrounding it I think like peripheral vision for basketball is great and um, how you can move for that kind of stuff um, yeah gymnastics about being being aware of how your body moves and dance and all these different elements can can have an effect uh, I do believe I don't believe in kind of pigeonholing them um, at a young age to, to one sport I think we should expose them as much as we can even if you know football's obviously played throughout the winter here um in the summer get them doing something else get mm-hmm. them doing getting them into another club whether whatever that might be because there's there's transferable skills in every sport if you do eventually want them to play football then then all those skills will be transferable so um you know my, my path was probably wasn't designed like that that was kind of probably just by chance yeah um, but like I say, I was quite active. I used to love going down the park. I just, was just down the park all the time. Just yeah. um, it was just down the end of my road. Just you know, there were some oak trees there. We used to just go and climb, swing off the branches, play games in the park where you're kind of evasion games. You know, tag and bulldog yeah. and all this kind of stuff. And I guess that just helped me. You know, eventually, when you go and play football, those kind of things are. Uh, a part of it, I suppose. So obviously, when you were eight years old, did were a lot of the other kids just starting out? Were there other kids who had been at the club for a long period of time? Like, did you go in and all of a sudden, like straight away, you were like, actually, you know, I'm pretty good at this? Or was it a case of it was a bit of a work in progress before you started yeah. to really develop your skills? I don't, I don't really know, mate, to be honest. I can't, to be honest, I can't remember how, like first joining. I, I can't remember how I felt back then. I, I, there was a point Probably when I was around 10, 11, something like that, I knew I was all right. Yeah. Um, just, you know, I could, I knew at school that I was good, particularly in secondary school. That when I was at that kind of age, I knew mm-hmm. that I was, you know, I was, I had a talent for it. Um, I, I always played as a centre half as well. I was always yeah. a defender. Um, a little bit in midfield as well, but I, I knew that I was I was capable. Do you know what I mean? I knew I could do, I could do more kick ups than than some of the other kids at that age. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That used to yeah. be bench, didn't it? When you were a kid, that was how many kick ups can you do? Oh yeah, I can do 120 or whatever it might be. Um, so I knew I had a talent for it. I I, I can't really remember how I felt in those in those early years because it kind of all, all merges into one. You, you kind of remember these things through photos and stuff that your mum and dad have, do you know what I mean? So I can remember some memories of those young, I mean, we had a great team. I, I just, all I remember is I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. My old man was, he would run the line um, or he would be the sponge man. It's like the physio <laughs> would come on with a bucket and sponge for everyone. It was just a lovely kind of community feel. You know, one parent would bring the oranges you know, you'd get you'd get filthy, dirty. To get jump back in the car, get home, wash it all off. You know, you'd have a little laugh and a joke with your mate. I, I absolutely loved it. I, I loved mm. everything about it. I loved the club and the the people, the coaches around it were were fantastic. So, you know, that obviously helped develop my love for the game. Um, which goes to show, at those young ages, you have to make it 
it has to be enjoyable. It mm. has to be fun. E- even now, when I'm coaching now, there's an element of, of all practices that have to be, you know, have to, people have to enjoy practice. You shouldn't be coming to practice thinking, oh, you know, here we go again. This is going to be a mm-hmm. slog. You're not going to get the best out of people. They're not going to love the game. Um, so, yeah, I just remember loving it. I really loved it. And then it was just by chance that I got picked up one day. I, I can't even remember what age I was when I, when I joined Wimbledon. I, I, I got scouted when I was, we had an away game at some team over in, somewhere in London anyway. We we, we used to do all right at Ascot, so we won the league. We, we, were, we were kind of, we were winning it most years with the group that we had. So we got put up into a different league a different region, more a London-based region. So there was more travelling involved, but it was more competitive for us. Um, so we, we joined that league and then, yeah, I mean, it's even little things like that, kind of driving around. You Just remember, it's just you and your old man and there's a big convoy of cars. There's about six or seven cars behind. This is the days before we can sat navs and everything so you were to meet at the training ground before all right guys come and let's everyone get the map out and we're all following convoy and some people get lost and do you know what i mean it was all that kind of stuff that's brilliant back then um traveling to london and then i played a game um i don't even know i can't remember the team we played against but then some chap just came up to my dad by chance he he just spoke to my dad after he didn't know obviously he didn't know he was my dad and just said oh that number six over there he's he's pretty good um does he play for anyone Dad was like, no, 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 that's actually my son. Um, he said, all right, okay. Um, just And he was, a, he was a scout for Wimbledon back then, um, before they were Milton Keynes Dons. Um, would he be interested in coming along to a trial? His name was Kim Harris, his name was, um, the guy that scouted me. Um, so his son was playing in the opposition team. It's not like they came specifically out to look at me. It was just I just had a particularly good game that day, I suppose. Um, so yeah, and then that was that, and that was my trial at Wimbledon. Went along there, and and then managed to join there as a schoolboy, probably when I was around yeah fourteen, something like that. Okay, something like that. It's quite interesting, like for any youngsters out there. Um, a, a lot of times, when people are, are manage to get their big break into professional football. It always seems to be a, a fortuitous stroke of luck. I was listening to a really interesting interview the other day. It was about Trent Alexander-Arnold, who's the right back at Liverpool. And um, he, as a youngster, there was a uh, Liverpool did summer camps or some sort of camp, and they they had uh, loads of kids who wanted to join this summer camp. So um, apparently, they said there are too many kids in his class who wanted to join. So they all put their name in the hat, and uh, they drew one name out from the hat. And, and Trent's was the name that they pulled out. And he went to the training session, like a, I guess it was like a football in a community type thing. And at seven years old, they were like, wow, he's really good for a seven-year-old. He's probably playing with older kids. And, and that's how they picked him up. But he said, like, had that teacher never pulled my name out of the hat? He said, like, okay, maybe I was good. So maybe I would have come, my chance would have come late, at a later stage. But yeah, often it is like this fortuitous stroke of luck that um, enables you to have this big break. Um, you know, I always say to kids that you never know who's watching. So no matter, it could be a training session that someone just happens to walk past and be like, wow, that kid's really good. And he catches your eye and, you know, he has a contact at another club and he, he says, right, okay, I'll bring him along. And my lucky break was from a school teacher. It was a PE teacher. He only just got the job and he came in, I was year seven and he, uh, he had just started. So he must've been like 22, 23 years old, young guy. And he just liked me and he picked up the phone and called up the, the uh, gut coach of Bryce and you take a look at this guy. It's so, it's, it's, it's always down to just, you know, being in the right place at the right time. And don't get me wrong, if you're good enough, there's, there, these opportunities will come back around in another form in a different way. But, you know, I think for any youngster that's out there listening into this or a parent, you know, really make sure that your kid is, is you know, don't wait for, okay, this is the opportunity. It's the cup final. So this is the game I've really got to give my best. No, it could be a random training session. It could be my two brothers got picked up on the park while I was having a training session. And the scout was watching my session. And it's like, oh, yeah, Chris, your two brothers are pretty good. You know, it's, you never know. You never know who's watching. So again, you know, just using Rob's example there. It, it's it's not about you know trying to impress in what you consider or perceive to be a big game. You, you've just really got to be on top of your game, ready for the opportunity at any given moment. 
Yeah, man. Like so many sliding doors moments for for everyone, right? It's just yeah, you, like you say, it's it's opportunity in its its opinion. Whether people ultimately make it to right to the top, you know, there's even when you make it, there's there's certain instances where. You know, when, even when I was um, a pro at Wimbledon, if I if if Wimbledon hadn't got relegated from the Premier League the year before, then I would never have made my debut because if they'd stayed in the Premier League, I wouldn't have made my, I wouldn't have played. So I might not have had a career. So it's actually beneficial for me that the club got relegated because then I played. Um, and then it all comes down to people's opinions, isn't it? Coach's opinion: Oh, I like him. I don't like him. And it's so subjective. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Just you never know who's watching. You never know who's watching. So then you got picked up by Wimbledon. So you did like a four-week trial, six-week trial, something like that. Yeah, something like that. I can't, again, mate, my my memory for this t- kind of stuff is not great. It's um, shocking. Let they, me just tell you that uh, it, it's awful. Yeah, come and say hi. This is Joseph. <laughs> say hi to everyone. Hello, JJ. How are you, mate? Hey, Joseph. Good. Okay. All right. Can you go back down for me, dude? I I saw you. I know you saw me downstairs. Go on, shut the door for me, boysy. It's like that BBC, it's like that BBC interview. Yeah, I know. Right, I knew. I was going to say at the beginning, one hundred percent, he'll come in. One hundred percent. Yeah, he's no. I, I was thinking uh, Lily was going to come in. To be honest, she's she's normally the big star, isn't she? So, uh, yeah, well, she she take, out, take over the show. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. yeah, like you say, I, I'm I'm useless with this kind of stuff, mate. I I, I don't really remember the the, the trial process. Um, Were you I, nervous? I, I know that we, um, yeah, You're quite confident. Yeah, no, I was nervous. I was nervous. I knew I, well, I was confident. I was comfortable at Ascot. You know, I knew that I was one of the better players at that in that team. Um, I knew that I was one of the better players at, like, my primary school, uh, at my secondary school. I knew, you know, I, I was confident in my ability um, in that kind of, that situation. But now you're talking about going against some of the best boys in South London. Um and for those of you that don't know, right? It's a hotbed. Of yeah, football for those of you that don't know, it's like Wimbledon at that time was the nickname was the Crazy Gang, so it was like an intimidating place to go. Um, I'm sure we'll come on to some of that stuff a little bit later on, but um, yeah, I mean the club had a reputation, had a reputation for for really talented, because at the time the club had to produce young players. Um, because they didn't have the money of some of the other clubs, so they, they relied heavily on their youth system coming through. Um, so that I, I, I knew all that kind of stuff going into there. I had no idea what to expect. I'd just been used to kind of um, grassroots coaching, essentially, um, to then have to go into a, a, a proper training session where there's passing patterns or you know specific things that you're working on. All of a sudden, was a, probably a little bit shocked. So he had to kind of acclimatise pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it obviously went well. I don't really remember. It was probably like a four-week trial or something where you come back. We used to train twice a week on a Tuesday and Thursday. Um, yeah, great. I think I was there, I must have only been there for two or three years because then that would I would have then got into my YT. So I would have been – It was a, we, we called it schoolboys back then. So I was a, I was a schoolboy for probably two seasons, two or three seasons, and then I would go into my YTS, which is like the full-time – uh, youth training program um yeah we used to play twice a week so it, i mean that was the school were great my, so i used to go to a place called charter school like down in sunningdale in berkshire um and i know that my old man had to pick me up i think on a tuesday and thursday one of the training sessions was a little bit earlier so he would pick me up from school i think i would always miss the tuesday session uh, whatever the last um session of the day was I think it was PE I've got a feeling it was PE rather ironically so I'd miss PE but dad would pick me up and the school would release me earlier because then the drive to to um to London was that was a pig to get there you know mate you've been to that that area of London before like it's from from us it was probably about an hour and 45 minutes hour and a half there so pick me up have some sandwiches or whatever in the car you, you're stuffing your face trying to get some food get down there train for an hour and a half whatever it is and come back and go to sleep and go to school and then we do it all again on Thursday and then you would have your game on the Saturday um, which is all London based team so you know gone are the days where you try five minutes up the road to play against Bracknell Bracknell Cavaliers you're now going all the way over to 
um, I don't know, Spurs or or Chelsea, wherever that may be. So, you know, the amount of sacrifice and effort my mum and dad, my dad particularly, put in for driving all around the country for us is, you know, you're kind of forever grateful for that that sacrifice that they made. Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, that was pretty much the schoolboy years. As you kind of keep going through the years, you, you would have, you get to probably this time of the year, April, April around, and you'd be thinking, oh, have I got in? And they would release some players and then you'd be told if you were kept on again. And, you know, it's a constant battle to try and prove yourself and show that you're good enough to, to get another year. And then you get another year and get another year. And then eventually I got, I managed to get selected to be in the, in the youth team itself, as the youth team proper. What was it like being Filipino in, in, in England during that time, uh, growing up? Was there, did it color your, your childhood at all? Um, no, not really. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm an only child as well. So it's just from your kind of the social, um, the social element of it, really. It was, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't ever have any problems with, with people picking on me or anything for looking any different to them. It, you know, I didn't have anything like that. And thankfully, um, I, and it, it, I just knew I was Filipino through my mum. She had a load of Filipino friends and, um, obviously family. We didn't have a great deal of family over here, but you know, the, the friendship group was quite extensive. Um, we used to go back, I think I went back two or three times before I actually came back to be part of the national team. Um, you know, so we had visited back home. So I, I knew, I knew about my heritage, and I knew, um, I knew about the family back home. I, you know, I had a, I had an idea of of that I wasn't fully English. I knew that I was half English, half Filipino. I knew, um, you know, the cuisine. Obviously, Mum cooks different cuisine to 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 your, your average kind of people over here. Um, yeah, just the big regret is that she never spoke to me in Tagalog, and I think I don't know why that is. I, I, I think that's a, all my like Chrissy. I know you're the same. Like all the all my friends over here that have got Filipino mums, just didn't really speak to us. In I think it's just a missed opportunity, really. But um, yeah, maybe it's because they wanted to talk about us behind our backs. Perhaps I don't know. Maybe but, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I mean, as far as I was aware, I was aware of everything. I was aware of my heritage and stuff. But yeah, it, it was just, it was just normal life. Do you know what I mean? It was just, right. just normal. Wimbledon then, and eventually you did make it into into the senior team, correct? Yeah. So I had two years, two years in a. They call it the like the YTS, so youth training scheme, um, where you you're you're basically full on at the club. Um, so that would have been your kind of A-level years. I don't know what years, what, what would be equivalent in the Philippines. So kind of 16, 16 to 19, 18, yeah. uh, 16 to 19. Um, I'd done two years there and that was very different to how, you know, they call that academy football now over here. It's very different to how academy football is nowadays. Um, you know, you had jobs, you know, I had to get in. I didn't live in digs. I lived I lived at home in Ascot and I used to have to get the train. I got two trains and a bus in every day. Um, I think the first year in YTS, we got paid £43 a week. Um, and then it went up to something like 60 quid for the second year. Um, I used to get like a little bit extra because I, um, they used to pay for my transport to get me to, get me to, to training every day. But you would have to be in for... Uh, like half nine, between nine and half nine, something like that. And then you would have your list of jobs to do straight away. I mean, they don't do this so much anymore, but everyone had to, you had two pros boots you needed to clean. Um, so that was the first job in the morning, get in, clean someone's boots, make sure that they were spick and span, polish them, ready for their, the pros to train when you're a YT. Um, and then you would obviously have to get all the equipment ready. You have to move goals. You know, back then they weren't these lovely goals on, on wheels that you can just flip up and push them around. You, they're weighed an absolute ton. So you, all the youth team would have to go and get the gear ready, wash the balls. We had to wash the balls before every training session. Um, then you go out and train. You do your bits and pieces, you train, um, and then come back and do your jobs after that as well. So again, like it, if, you were, if you were smart, you'd get ahead and 
probably clean the boots after training so you didn't have to do too much in the morning. Um, sweep the changing rooms, sweep the sweep the physio room. My my job was always the physio room, which was terrifying because back in the day they were it like I say it was a crazy gang. It was they were absolute lunatics there. It was it was an intimidating <laughs> place to to learn your football education. They were. I mean, they were met like proper men. Do you know what I mean? And you wouldn't say boo to a goose back then. You you just keep your head down as much as you possibly could. Get on with your job. Stick stick in your changing rooms where all the rest of the youth team boys were, and don't really interact with the first team lot. Because if you kind of gave them a funny look, then you might be in a little bit of trouble. So, um, which obviously wouldn't be allowed nowadays. But you know, looking back, it, it toughens you up. It, it kind of it makes you. Um, it gives you a certain amount of respect for, for the hierarchy within the club and within the players. Um, and it was it was an intimidating atmosphere, but it was one that I absolutely loved. I loved being with the boys um, every day. You know, you'd train again Monday to Friday, play on a Saturday. Um, you're just around football all the time. And it was it was great. And I think there was so you do two years I've done my two years of my YTS and there was three of us from my age group that, that made it that we got a pro contract at the end of it um, so I guess I would have thought around six seven boys got let go probably a few more um, and I was one of the lucky ones to get a pro contract after that and and you know there's so many talented boys that got got released at the end of their um, at the end of their their YTS but you know, I guess I was just one of the lucky ones, I suppose. I, I, I'd probably just done enough. What was it, Rob, do you think that set you apart from those other kids? Because obviously I'm a few years younger than you. Um, and I know some of the boys who were coming through sort of still school boys when you were probably doing your YT and got your pro. But what was it do you think that set you apart from, from some of the other boys that let go? Was it your attitude? Was it just solely down to ability? Like, can you, can you pinpoint, do you think, what... Because obviously there's very fine margins between making it and not making it. I think that's one of the things that people don't realise when you're in your here. Um, the difference between making it and not making it is so, so slim in, in, in places like the UK and any, any sort of top league around the world. Um, and it often isn't a case of, oh, you know, you're letting someone go because they're miles worse than you or you're much, much better than another player. It really doesn't come down to that. I'm sure there's, there might have been players in your group who you might have thought, well, they're much better player than me, but but weren't able to play at the level that you did. So w- was there anything that you sort of could pinpoint as to why you managed to, to kick on where, where some of the other players weren't quite able to do so? Uh, I don't know. It, it, like I said before, a lot of it comes down to circumstance as well and being just being the right moment for you. There, there probably was... There, there's probably girl, uh, girls, I say, because I'm thinking about like our girls now have... Uh, we, unfortunately, we've had to let some girls go at the end of their second year now. So I'm just trying to put myself in that situation. But we've had – sometimes it's it's not about the individual or the ability of the individual. It's what the first team have got as well. So are the first team – have they got a plethora of central midfielders? So then the first team manager would be saying to the youth team manager, you know what, we don't actually need any centre mid- mids at the minute. We're okay. We need more centre halves, or we need more wingers, or whatever they might mean. So sometimes it's it's just you're just unlucky that it's that it's that year for me. I was, I've always been technically okay, like technically proficient. I could always pass the ball well. I had decent technique. Um, nothing kind of, you know, you wouldn't look at me and go, "Wow, that's that was amazing." But it's. You know, I had a solid foundation in most test technical aspects of the game. I could see a pass. Um, I think probably what set me apart was I could read the game really well. Um, even back then, um, I was a centre-half. So, I mean, for, for a club like Wimbledon to take a punt on me, um, like a 5'10", 5'11", centre-half, you know, they must have seen something in me to to give me that opportunity because obviously centre halves are normally six foot plus, you know, whether I would have made it in today's game would be very questionable. Um, but I, I read the game really well. I could sit, I could see danger. I could sense danger. I would, I would be in the right place at the right time. Generally. Um, Do you think that's natural? Yeah. Or do you think, is that something that you, you learned through 
you know, really good coaching um, or something that you made your own observations through being analytical, watching games, etc. Like, because I, I, when I when I think about you as a player, like not not being disrespectful, but physically, like not not as you said alluded to, you're not the most uh, physically blessed. But you know, look at like some of the modern day centre backs, like a Virgil Van Dijk, for example. I mean, he's a specimen. Mm. But I always, whenever I think back to your career playing alongside you there was very very few times where i'd like is pace was an issue you always seem to be like okay right well if i am against an opponent who physically is more capable i might just need to give him an extra yard or i might just need to position myself in a situation where i don't get in a foot race with this individual but is that something that was learned or do you think that was something that was that just came naturally to you um by the time I was probably playing with you, that that would have come with experience a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, back when I was younger, I was I was actually quite quick. Um, right. So as you get older, you obviously you lose half a yard. Yeah. Um, so you have to adapt your game accordingly as you get older. Um, I don't. I don't know is the answer to that. I, I guess. I don't know. There, there, there's a lot to be said about talent and how much of talent is nurtured is talent a thing or is it something that's nurtured along the way I, I i can't i can't picture any kind of scenarios or any instances in my in my development that meant that i was um that that meant i was really good at reading the game like thinking about it now perhaps the fact that i was a smaller center half meant that i had to adjust my game accordingly Mm-hmm. You know, I, I couldn't. If there was a tall striker, I couldn't. I couldn't out jump them. So I had to. I had to be smart, and I had to outthink how. How am I gonna? If I can't go and compete with you airily for this ball, what's another way I might be able to? I might be able to win the ball off you. Maybe I might sneak around the side and get my header in around the side of you. Maybe I might mm-hmm. drop off a little bit deeper so you pin me a little bit deeper, and then I nick in front of you to win the header. Do you know what I mean? So maybe that maybe my physical stature meant that I had to adjust my game accordingly, perhaps. Um, but I don't know. I could just see pictures in the game. I could see, I could see like defensive pictures more than attacking situations. And I guess maybe that's that's down to exposure doing it, playing solely as a centre half when I was younger, perhaps. Mm. Um, being in that situation multiple times helps. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I was pretty good at reading people's body language. Um, I could see from the shape of their body what they were likely to do, what pass they were likely to make. Um, I, I was pretty good at kind of um, understanding my opponent quite quickly. So, you know, when I, whenever I played, it was kind of all right. So, what type of player are you? What what type of player am I playing against today? Are you quick? So, do I need to give myself a couple more yards? Are you physical? So, all right, I don't want to get involved in that. So, how can I win the ball differently off you? Um, are you an intelligent player? Do you like to drop off deep? All right. Well, if you do, I'm going to go really, really tight and not like, give you any space. You know, all those kind of things. Mm-hmm. I was pretty good at kind of recognizing what my opponent was like. Um, but I could just see pictures. I, I, I. I like I know when we when you were talking about your your Ascals eleven and stuff, and you you were mentioning me about making blocks and stuff, that was kind of me. I was always kind of being in the right place at the right time to 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 make those tackles, and um, I could just I just felt like I could read the game pretty well. Mm. I think that's probably and even back then. So I, I wasn't the captain of my youth team. <clears throat> um, I was always kind of in and around that. I was always seen as a more senior player. Um, that was probably another element. My attitude was really good towards training. Um, I, you know, I didn't cause any trouble. Um, so I was reliable. So if they asked me to do a job, I'd get on and do it. Um, I, I like to think I was a pretty good teammate to everyone as well. So, you know, when you package all that up together, that was probably enough to get me a pro contract. It's quite funny, isn't it? You, you talk about those things because it, it, there's loads of those little sound bites or memes that go around about you know, things that don't cost you anything as a as a as a, as a, as a footballer if you want to make it. You know, like things like being on time, you know, being a good teammate, you know, not not causing issues in and around the, the club. It might seem like 
you know, boring stuff, really, if, if I'm being quite quite honest. But when you're dealing with very small margins like that, and it comes into making a decision as to whether or not you're going to get it or another guy's going to get it, you know, these are the things that, that make all the difference. And I think that's some of the things that are really lost on a lot of the kids that I see coming through the system who want to make it. They're not prepared to do these the small things um, that ultimately make, make those big differences. Um, yeah, I mean, and the, we... Um... But three things that, so even now when I'm coaching, like we have, I have three rules. Okay. So all, all the other kind of stuff is a given. So there's a baseline for everything else, obviously coming to training and working hard, making sure you put all your effort in all these kind of bits and pieces that should be a given now at the, the level that the girls are at. That's, you know, that's like a non-negotiable essentially. Um, the three rules that we have are totally unrelated to football. It's, and it's a little bit off, um, off, it's from the, the, at the All Blacks book, The Legacy. I don't know if you've read mm, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'd highly recommend anyone to read that. That's, that's absolutely shaped my coaching career without question. Mm. Um, one would be be on time. Number two is don't, um, don't be late is number one. Number two is we tidy up after ourselves. And number three is no dickheads, we say. So excuse my language. But they're, they're the three Sorry, main kids, if you're listening. Uh, sorry, right. kids. It's no idiots. We'll call it idiots from now idiots, on. Idiots, yeah. So number one, and, and, and yes, those things are, are, are relevant because everyone wants to be punctual. Everyone, we want to have a tidy space for us to work in. But I say to the girls, and I've said to in, in, in other teams I've coached as well, we're late because I need to be able to rely on you. We need to be able to rely on each other that we can, we're disciplined enough to be able to, um, to be on time for something. Okay, I need to rely on you that if I give you an instruction to be somewhere on time, I need you to be able to do that. Just like if I was to give you an instruction to, to on the pitch, I need to know that I can rely on you to be able to do that. We tidy up after ourselves is, well, that's just number one. That's just the nice thing to do. And that's how everyone should be. If everyone has rubbish, they should put it in the bin, obviously. But the deeper meaning to that is um, we tidy up after ourselves on the pitch. So if any of you girls make a mistake on the pitch, we don't rely on anyone else to, to clean up our mess. You know, we take care of it ourselves. Like, so for whatever that is. So that's number two. And then number three, no idiots, is just, you know, we're, at all times we're representing the club. You're representing you as a player. You're representing um, your parents at all times. So, you know, you, you, the way you are acting around referees, opposition, you know what I mean? Like, there's a certain way that we need to be acting and, and um, you know, the, the certain way we need to carry ourselves at all times. They're the three main the three main rules of the academy. Um, they're the big ones. And so they might seem like trivial, be on time to tidy up and no idiots, but everything there has a kind of deeper meaning. Um, and like go linking into what you were saying before about all those little bits, they matter. Those things matter. Being reliable to your coach, be in whatever job you're going to go in, being reliable in your job, being being on time, being punctual, being um, being honest, all these kind of things, they that they ultimately shape the person that you are, not just the not just the player you are. And nowadays, it's the whole package that you have to be on point with everything in order for you to be able to make it. Now, yeah, no, spot on. I think the other thing I want to touch upon here, Rob, as well is, you know using your deficiencies as basically enhancing your strengths. You know, there was a really interesting um, interview with uh, Drew Brees. I don't know if you know him, the uh, quarterback uh, plays in the NFL, but he's an undersized quarterback. And what he was saying is, he's, I think he's less than six foot. And he's saying, I've got a bunch of these massive men in front of me. So for a quarterback, normally it's important that you're tall so you can see obviously over these guys' heads and then you can, you can kind of pick your passes. But he says... Because I'm small, he said, a lot of times I'm, I, I throw things that I think I see. I'm not 100% sure, but I throw them on instinct. He said, I, th I throw it on instinct. So like, I'll, I'll sort of see half of the, the route being run, and then I'll throw it because I think that's where he should be. And invariably, he connects more than he, mm. he doesn't. That's why he's, he's a you know, NFL quarterback for the past 10 years at the highest level so it's quite interesting you say that although it's a deficiency maybe being a defender that's undersized what actually happens it, it, it accentuates your other senses and, and and maybe enable you to create this more cerebral footballer 
which enabled you to, okay, right, well, I'm not going to get into that physical confrontation. I'm not going to get into a fight with this guy. I'm going to use a more acute or a clever way in order to combat my opponent, which I think ultimately maybe that, that, that was one of the reasons why you, uh, you were able to uh, often outthink or outposition or outmaneuver opponents that probably had more physical capability um, than, than, than you had. Yeah, I mean, you, you, have, you have to be honest as a footballer or as a, as a sportsman in general. You have to know what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And that kind of comes with a little bit more experience. Maybe I was able to pick that up when I was a little bit younger. But there was no point in me thinking, right, I'm going to be a massive dominating centre-half that bullies people out of the way. It was just never going to happen. I'm half Filipino. Do you know what I mean? So I just, that, was, that was just never going to – I wasn't tall enough. Um, I didn't have the, the genes – um, to be able to be massive. It just wasn't going to happen. So at a young age, I knew what player I had to be. So, you know, advice to, to players out there is really try and understand what kind of a player you are. You know, not... not and, and the difficult thing with that is it's not the player that you would like to be. Everyone would love, love to be Messi. Everyone would love to be Cristiano. But do you have the physical capabilities to be that player? And you need to be really, really brutally honest with yourself because if you don't, then you need to think, okay, I can't be that. But how, what, if, I, if this is my goal, if professional football is my goal, if professional sport is my goal, how can I get there? I might have to take a different route to the one that I, how I dream, excuse me, how I dreamt it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. Just, just being totally honest with yourself and thinking, right, my attributes are this, that and the other. But I, I, I would never have been, I wouldn't have been able to be a winger. I couldn't, I, you know, I wasn't skillful enough. I wasn't tricky enough. I didn't have that turn of pace to get past people. So I knew, you know, I needed to either be a centre half, possibly a fullback um, back then, not in, not in the modern day fullback. But, you know, I knew there were certain positions in the pitch where I could probably, I, would, I was more likely to succeed. Were there players that you looked up to that you modeled your game after or, or whose trajectory of career that you, you modeled your, your career after growing up? Uh, um, when, I was, when I was young, young, um, my, like I said, my dad was a football, uh, Liverpool fan. So I used to watch a lot of Liverpool games back then. It was the Liverpool teams of the 80s. This just kind of shows how old I am. But um, my dad used to love Alan Hansen like when he was playing. Like it was a centre half, but he, you know, the Liverpool teams of that era, they would just dominate the ball possession as well. But they would also, you know, drive out with the ball into space and be so comfortable. I really looked up to him, you know, when I was really little. Um, and then when I was in, um, when I was at Wimbledon, um, Chris, there's a guy called Chris Perry. Chris, you'll know him. Um, it's so it's so it's so funny you mention him before you go on and talk to you about about him because when you were mentioning some of the attributes that you possessed, he was the player that came to mind and thinking like although Wimbledon as a as a traditional club were very physical, um, for those of you that know, I had a season ticket at Wimbledon, so I'd watch him all the time and I was amazed at how incredible he was at um, you know aerial combat for someone who was so small, how positionally he was so adept against these you know incredibly pacey world-class centre forwards and when you were saying all of those things Rob he absolutely yeah he was, he was the yeah. first player that, that sprang to mind yeah so he was one so again like Chrissy was saying he was probably my height <clears throat> probably skinnier than me um playing in the prem against you know some of the best players in the world so I knew that I could model my game on him a little bit so I'd watch him closely in training and in games and, and different things that he would do in games um you know, I'd, li I'd like to think that I was a little bit more composed in possession than Chrissy was. Um, but I don't know that maybe that's just me thinking through rose tinted glasses. But, um, you know, that, that, that those were the players. I mean, I didn't really I didn't really kind of look up to, to anyone else. I just I was focused in on what I needed to do as a player and the, the, the player that I needed to be. So then you started playing in the championship shortly after with uh, Wimbledon. What was that experience like? Um, and if you were to compare the level that you were playing at in the championship back then and the championship today, how would you um, describe the difference in, in, in quality? 
Yeah, I mean, that was a tough league. I mean, like I say, I, the first team got relegated from the Premier League the year before. So we still had quite a few um, like really experienced and really top pros playing at that time. Um, and I think we finished our first season in the championship. We were certainly top 10. We obviously didn't make playoffs, but we were top 10, I think. Um, I know that because um, I got a bonus because of it. I, I remember. <laughs> that's, that's how I remember. <laughs> Um, but I, I must have played, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe 12, 13 games or something like that in that first season um, against in the championship. And we were competitive that year. Um, and it was it was just super physical. It was, it, you know, the step up when you when you actually make your debut. I was terrified the day I made my debut. Um, that's that shirt there. Uh, where is it? That one there. That's my debut shirt. Um, so 2000, I think it is. Yeah. October to uh, October, 2000. So I would have been 19 at the time. Um, 1920, something like that. Um, and yeah, just nervous. And, and the, the, the difference is, well, obviously the pace of everything is, is, is quicker, but just how you get punished for mistakes is just, you know, one mistake and it could lead to something else. And then that's your fault. You know, that, that's, that's the big, big difference. Um, it was a physical league. There were some really, really good players playing at that time. Um, and you kind of have to learn very, very quickly. Um, yeah, yeah, you have to, <laughs> you're thrown in massively at the deep end. You've got players and everyone playing for mortgages and stuff like that. And so a win is... It's like gold dust. You need to you need to do everything you can to get that win. Um, but that was a great, great experience. So that I mean, we done all right in our first season, but then the second and third years were tough at Wimbledon because a lot of the money came out of the club, um, and a lot of the a lot of the as a result with a lot of the money going out, a lot of the better te- better players left. So for the second and third years. Um, three and four, whatever it might be, we we used a lot of lot of young players. So the year that we actually got relegated out of the championship, um, we like most of the team now was all you know youth products um, that had come through the youth system. So that that was that was an eye opener. You know you. you you're relying on the, the club is relying on really, really young kids who maybe one or two of them were ready for first team football. I mean, was I ready? Probably just it, when I had a decent amount of experience around me, I would have been ready. But then for years two and three, when you're kind of then seen as one of the senior players, but you're only like 22 um, and you've got youngsters, 18 year olds playing in the championship. That's really, really tough. Um, we had it was it, that was a really really tough time I mean we went through the whole um, I'm not sure how people how people know about Wimbledon but they let, we used to ground share with Crystal Palace because we didn't have a, our own home stadium over in Wimbledon um, then new owners came in and they were saying to in order for this club to survive we had to move from Wimbledon to go to Milton Keynes so they're now the Wimbledon that I used to play for technically is known as now as Milton Keynes Dons. Um, so moving a club from South London to up the road, a couple of hours to Milton Keynes, which was a relatively new, new city, if you like. Um, you know, that obviously didn't go down too well with the local fans. And it was, that was a really, really tough time. We, we were young kids playing in the championship um, with a couple of experienced players in and around us as well, um, having to deal with going up, moving up to Milton Keynes. Obviously, the fans weren't happy about it. They were saying that we should, um, you guys need to, what, what are you doing as players? You need to boycott. You shouldn't be moving up there. And we're like young players that just wanted to be pros. Um, just kind of got your first senior contracts, you know, you, you know your future's on the line, if you like. Um, I remember one day we there were some really really angry protests, like on the bus leaving somewhere. People were 
were throwing stuff at the bus, like local black fans and stuff. It was that was really really hard work. Um, and ultimately, the club was all over the place, and and it cost us the it cost us a, a position in the championship. So we got relegated, and then after that, then I then I left the club after that. And then for the next five five years or so, it yeah. seems like there was a, a few clubs that you you, you joined. Um, Describe that experience of the next five years of your footballing career. Obviously, you've broken through. You've made the dream. You're a pro. You're playing in the championship. And then things start to unravel a little bit, uh, get relegated again. Club is, is changed. And then sort of there's a, it seems like there's a bit of turmoil for the first time in your, in your footballing career where things are not exactly moving as planned. Yeah, exactly. I mean, my time at Wimbledon was great. I made 70 odd appearances there in the champ and it was, it, I loved it. And you know, your first couple of seasons, you think, ah, this is good. I've cracked it. I'm, I'm sorted now. We're all good I'm playing here, playing in the championship. And then, like you say, everything kind of turns on a sixpence and we get relegated and then you, you're all of a sudden out of contract. So, again, we're going back to talking about being lucky and, you know, circumstance dictating um, where your career goes. My, my youth team manager at the time, two of my youth team coaches left Wimbledon and went to join Russian and Diamonds, who were playing in League Two at the time, um, to be coaches down there, and they took me and another lad from Wimbledon, and we 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 played at Russian and Diamonds for a couple of years. So a team up in Northamptonshire. Um, so I had to move home to to go and play up there. I mean, that was a great time as well. Like, I, but I, I unfortunately, went to another club that was kind of in a bit of financial trouble. Um, just avoided relegation in the first year. I had a really, really good year that year. Um, I won like players, uh, supports player of the year and all these kind of different pieces. And looking back in hindsight, I should have probably tried to leave the club at that point um, because my stock was high. Decided to stick it out and, and give the club like kind of honor my contract and, and stick it out. And in the second season, the money, all, all the money got pulled from the club. Um, and we really struggled, and we got relegated that year as well. So I'd been relegated twice in the space of two in the space of like two wow. seasons, um, which was tough. Um, and then you kind of get to the point where it's like, okay, who really? You know, when you look at when you're trying to find another club after I got released from, well, my contract finished at Rushton. Um, they didn't kind of renew many people's contracts after that because um, the club was in such a bad state. Um, so then you're looking, all right, so I'm a five foot 11 centre half player in playing in the lower leagues. Yes, I've got experience. Um, I probably had like 150 games by this point in the league. Um, yes, I've got experience playing in it, but he's just had two relegations in two years. <laughs> um, are we really going to take a punt on him? Um, so that was after I left Rushton. That was that was really really tough. I, I didn't know where I was going. Uh, the season after that was an absolute nightmare. So I I I, tr um, I managed to get myself into came. So now I'm dropping out of the football league into the conference. Um, so step what what tier is that, Chris? Five, tier five, something like Nine, that. Tier fifth tier, yeah, fifth tier. Yeah. Um, and still, it's still a really good, you know, really good level over there. I mean, the, the teams that I went to were still full time. There was, you know, so you were still a pro if you like. I spent half the season at Cambridge United. Um, then, again, the money went out of that club, and uh, there was a massive personnel change. So the, the gaffer that brought me in got sacked. Um, I was only on a rolling contract, so that didn't get renewed. And then I went to Woking for the rest of that that year. Played a few games down there again in the conference. Um, so that was a tough season so I played for two clubs in one season then I went to Aldershot um, so again in the conference and we I trialled there I had to go on on trial um, in pre-season and I've done really well and they took me on as a fullback believe it or not I've, I've kind of managed to blag my way in and, and say yeah yeah I've, I've played there loads I'm brilliant at fullback and I hadn't really I was more centre half but we won the league that year um we got promoted. I played a lot of games for all the shot that year. I think I, I must have played, you know, I, I came in as kind of second choice, but the, our first choice right back got injured. So I ended up playing the majority of the season and we had a cracking year. I mean, the team was brilliant. Like the, 
the the coaching staff were great. The group of lads was amazing, and we we kind of we won the league at a canter. So I thought, yes, finally my t- you know, I've gone down into the conference. I've had a crap year last year, but now we've won the league this year. I get to go back into the league. Happy days. And then I was one of I was one of three people um, that didn't get offered a new contract at the end of that season. The other two lads that didn't get a contract were two lads that were like um, they'd been injured, like long term injuries. So I um I just it, I was absolutely devastated. You know I kind of thought, you know, I it still annoys me to this day. Really, I I deserve to to have another shot in the league. And the, and the the gaffer at the time, a guy called Gary Waddock. Um, I mean, he was a brilliant manager. He, he he managed the team really well. I think it was down to again. I was at the I was at the other end of a, the wrong circumstance. He he knew he knew someone that wanted to. And you know, he was mates with an agent that wanted to get a right back in, and they needed to get rid of me to get him in. Blah blah blah. All this kind of stuff. And then you start to see the really really ugly side of football. Um, I deserve to I deserve to get another contract that year without question. Um, um, so that really, really hurt me. And I didn't really realise how much that affected me and my career. Um, so this would have been about 2007, something like that, 2008, I think it was that season. So the highs and the, the massive, massive highs of, yes, we got promoted and we won the cup as well. And the, the lads were brilliant. It was local to me. You know, all these things were falling into place. And then to get it taken away, uh, it, it really, really... I don't, I, at the time, I didn't realise how much it affected me. Um, I went from there to a team down in Essex called Grey's Athletic. Um, and it was it was just an absolute nightmare, which is rather ironic because that picture you put up to, with me on Facebook is of me at, at, on my time at Grey's. Um, <laughs> and it was so happy I, in the I, picture. Yeah, I know, the start of the year. And it was, it was one of those where... I had quite a few teams interested in me because obviously now my stock was a little bit higher in the conference. Um, so they came in really, really early, almost like I'd just been released. The season had just finished at all. And Grace came in, offered me a two-year deal. I was a little bit unsure. I was like, you know what? I just want to get sorted. I don't want to have to go out on trial. I don't want to have to wait late. I've had two years of that. I just want to get sorted so I know where I can focus on my football. They offered me decent money. So it's like, okay, cool, let's... You know, they spoke really, really well. And it was just an absolute disaster. Again, the club was, it, it was, it just wasn't a nice place to play football. I was driving from Oxfordshire all the way around the M25 every day to down to Wessex. We were carpool. The best part about that whole season was like I had a little, decent little car crew. But it's five of us who were a bit of a laugh in the car. It was an absolute nightmare and total disaster. So that was now, we're now talking at 2009 which now kind of links into to all the ASCAL stuff. Light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, yeah, so, I, I remember we were sort of, there's a little bit of an overlap there, isn't it? Of kind of, you made your debut with a national team, what year, 2007, something like that, right? No, 2009 it would have been, like um, oh, okay. the Challenge okay. Cup. Um, would have been that late? Like, yeah, I think so, yeah, just before the Suzuki Cup in 2010. <laughs> 2009. You only played one tournament before that? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Challenge well, Cup my, in the Maldives. Well, mine's a little bit, it's a bit like you when you were a youngster. A little yeah, hazy. No, I'm a bit clearer now. I can remember. Yeah, no, I hope so. It's only 10 years ago, mate. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, what, what can you remember? Because I, I, we'd, we'd never met. I can remember the first time we met you, which was at the PFF office. I think I'd come yeah. in with Anton and we were like, oh, we've got, we've got this new guy coming in from the UK. Never didn't know who you were. Although, as it turns out, we 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 sort of rolled in similar circles, with quite quite a, with quite a few similar uh, people who we knew. So anyway, you came to the office. I remember Anton going, "That can't be him. <laughs> He's white. <laughs> He's just a white guy. He can't have any." And I think, did he actually say? I think he might have even said, "You can't have any Filipino in you at all." Yeah, he did. Anton. I think yeah. he said something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that was our, that was my first introduction to you. What what can you remember about your first few days, sort of integrating with, with the group? <laughs> um, well, I it was all it was weird because I, I my mum kept pestering me, like she said, oh, you should." Jo-. 
like all through my career, she said, just get in touch with the Philippines. I think they might have a, they might have a team. They might, I was like, yeah, mum, I don't, I, I don't even know if they've got a team. I don't know what's happening. And I, I don't really remember how it came about, but I th- maybe my mum linked me through it or something, but someone reached out to me on Facebook. Um, and I just, I literally sent an, a message via Facebook, like a private message. I said, look, this is me. This is who I've played for. Um, would you guys be interested in, in me coming along and trying to help out? So I was still at Grey's at this point, but kind of coming towards the end of it all. Um, and I didn't hear anything for like six months, n- nothing. And then all of a sudden I had a phone call. I was in my car and it was um, Mary Martinez, the, the PFF president at the time. And he said, um, hey, Rob, blah, blah, blah. This is who I am. And thanks for your email. We'd really like to invite you along to a tournament. I was like, okay, cool. So this is probably around um, February, March time, 2009. He said, yeah, yeah, we, it'd be great to get you out. It's in, a, it's in about six weeks' time. I was like, okay, right, that's soon. Um, would you be interested? It's over in the Maldives. So I was like, oh, okay, because I was having a crap time at Grey's. It was an absolute nightmare. I, I wanted to kind of end my contract anyway. So I went to Grey's and said, look, can we just – like it must have been about April. So there's probably like six weeks of the season left. I said, look, could we just, let's just end this now. Just the club said, yeah, okay, we'll pay you up. We won't take up your option because I had another year option on there. I said, look, just, just, let's just end it now so I can go away and play for these. So that all kind of finished. Um, and then I went and obviously joined up with you boys. And yeah, it was all, <laughs> it was all a little bit weird. So I, I don't know if you remember, but I had, um, Jason De Jong at the time was um, he was joining with the national team as well, and um, I can't remember how it all came about. But anyway, we connected through Facebook, me and Jason, and he was like, oh, "Hi Rob, yeah, I'm, my name's Jason. I play for the national team as well. We'll be going out on, um, we'll be going flying out to to the Philippines together." I was like, "Ah, oh, cool, man. Hey, how you doing?" And I remember I was on, I was chatting to Chad as well at the time. And um, I think Jason was supposed to go and stay with Chad or was supposed to go and stay with someone before he went to the Philippines anyway. And then the next thing I know, he's rung me up again and said, ah, oh, you know what, Giro? Um, I ain't got anywhere to stay. Is there any chance that I can fly over to the UK, stay with you for like a couple of weeks, and then we'll go over to the Philippines together? <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> yeah all right dude like, whatever like cool come along i don't know you i can't believe this is even like a thing but yeah like fill your boots man so anyway he came and i had to pick him up from the airport um brought him here um he stayed actually stayed with my mum and dad for a couple of days while i got got everything sorted um <laughs> and then um yeah so then he, he come up and stayed with me for like um uh, you know what? Like it's funny. Like so, we would um, <laughs> we're obviously trying to like keep fit or whatever. Like so, we he said, "Oh come on, Rob, let's go down the park and we'll do some like crossing and finishing." And stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, okay, it's cool. We just me and him just went down the local park. I was just doing, we we're just like pinging the ball to each other and just kind of, like just I was just keeping a, a young lad. Of, I, I don't know what he would have been at the time. How much younger is Jason than us, Chris? I don't know. Don't but, know. Yeah. Must have been a teenager. Yeah, yeah he was a teenager. He, th- th- this was Jason De Jong, the Cristiano Ronaldo years, and um, <laughs> um, but he was brilliant. Like he, he, he was fearless, man. He just come and we he, he got he mucked in with the family. Like I've got a rental property here in the, in the UK, and I needed to turn it around. I had new tenants coming in. He was like, "Yeah, no problem, man. I'll come in." And I had him painting the bathroom, <laughs> getting it ready. <laughs> getting it all ready for like these new tenants coming in and he was like it was no problem for him he's like yeah cool i'll come and help and he was he was mucking in and anyway yeah so that was kind of my first proper experience of the national team was jason de Jong living in my house for two weeks um so this, so this, is, be- and, this is before you've even gone to the philippines yeah this is before i even met any of you lot um yeah anyway yeah so me and me and jason then eventually went out we stayed with i met you guys um, we stayed with Ernie Neres, me, and then Neil was there as well at the time. Um, 
there's a few of us. I think Jimmy stayed as well. Me, Jimmy, and um, Neil, I think it was. You, did you stay at Ernie's or not? I can't remember. No, no, no. No, I had a place. I had a place to stay, yeah. Um, yeah, so we crashed around Ernie's place. We lived there, and what we do is doing some training and stuff. So met Neil, met the other boys as well. It was really weird. Like, I hadn't been back to the Philippines for a long time, probably since I was about 11, something like that. So quite a few years since I went back. And I remember sitting in the taxi on the way, on the, on the way to Ernie's. Um, or just, I just remember sitting in the car on the way to Ernie's just thinking, this just, everything about the whole situation just felt right. Like, everything just felt so familiar. Like, I, I was looking out the window and it just, I know it sounds super, super corny, but I just felt like I was almost like I'd come home like this was the place I needed to be um, it was a really really nice comforting feeling I'll never forget that you know I, I just remember jeepneys kind of going past and like all the hustle and bustle and it was chaotic it was madness everywhere and I just thought I just felt really at home and really really at ease with the whole situation um, yeah so we stayed at Ernie's and then we started training down in San Beda. Um I remember like the, the pitch, well, it wasn't, I, it, I don't think you can technically call it a pitch, can you? It was, <laughs> dust uh, ball. That's the cage, right? It the was cage? an absolute dust yeah, cage. ball. Um, yeah, so it was, it was, you know, that was a bit of an eye-opener from, from being a pro over in the UK and having, you know, nice grass pitches and stuff and all that kind of business. And then you're going to, going to train there and it was literally a dust bowl. I remember thinking, I remember thinking, like there's not enough grass on this pitch to like feed a cow. Like that's that. I was speaking to my parents at home, like saying, "Mom, Dad, I don't know if this father made the right decision or not." Like there's, it's just dust. But um, yeah, ultimately, it's it was it was certainly an experience. Um, and then we obviously travelled to the Maldives, and, and and that was my first tournament. Was the was Challenge Cup qualifiers, two thousand nine. Yeah, can you remember much about that competition? Um, yeah, I remember. I remember the hotel was, oh, I was, weren't great, was it? It wasn't like we like when we went for Challenge Cup when we stayed on Bandos. We stayed on Mali. Um, yeah, the hotel weren't great. I remember us doing like um, our limber and stuff up and down the stairs and like in any space that we could get. Um, but again, I, I loved it. Uh, I'd, I'd come, you know, you have to appreciate. I come off a couple of years of like really, really tough times in my career to a place where I kind of, um, you know, people not not that they were looking up to me, but um, there was a certain amount of expectation with me. I suppose they were expecting me to be able to deliver, and I kind of I, I enjoyed that. Um, Coach Harris at the time put a lot of faith in me, which was great. Um, the tournament itself, um, obviously the game, the first game, um, we did we draw or did we beat East Timor, wasn't it? Was it East Timor or someone? You don't even remember your yeah. debut. I don't remember my debut. And then the second game was the Maldives. Yeah, so the first game we played uh, Bhutan. And we Bhutan. Won, Bhutan. And we won 1-0. <laughs> yeah, we only won 1-0. 1-0, one, one, one nil. Nil. yeah. Um, mm. yeah it, was, I mean, it was a comfortable game, but yeah, we didn't yeah. really get the scoreline that our sort of dominance would uh, would suggest. So we kind of put us in a bit of a difficult situation because we knew that, you know, Maldives and Turkmenistan were the two sort of yeah supposed teams that were supposed to qualify out of the group. So we knew, we, you know, if we didn't run up the scoreboard in that game, we, we were sort of giving ourselves a bit of an uphill task. The second game was a completely different, yeah. different scenario, wasn't it? Can you, can you remember that game? I... <laughs> That was Maldives, right? Yeah, Maldives, second game. Um, yeah, I mean, that was madness. So, you know, you're used to... I was used to playing in front of crowds, obviously, in the UK. But, I mean, this was... Um, the, the fervour around the ground, like, the, the, the passion and stuff. It was intimidating place to go and play. Um, don't really remember too much about the game. I know... Um, did Ali get sent off, didn't he? And he got sent off. Yeah, so we went one he scored, we went one nil up. Yeah, he scored, didn't he? And then he got sent off. Yeah, and he got sent um, off. And then they scored from the penalty, which meant that we were yeah. a bit of a difficult situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean I remember it was just 
it was just a mad game, wasn't it? I mean, the pitch wasn't particularly great. It was quite hard and bobbly. It was, um, you know, it, just stuff that I'm not, I wasn't particularly used to. I know, obviously, you're climatised over a little bit in Manila, but you're playing games in that kind of humidity and the pitch was tight. You know, they were baying for blood, weren't they, really? It was a really intimidating atmosphere. When they scored, yeah. I remember people jumping up on the on the fences and, you know, going absolutely crazy. Um which compared to the game before when it was an empty stadium, it was, you know, that was an eye-opener. Um, but, yeah, so I, I obviously, you know, we lost that game. And then the game at the end, we, we got whacked, didn't we? Yeah. Um, I think 5-0, wasn't it, to Afghanistan? Five yeah. Nil, yeah. Um, but, I mean, overall, I, I really enjoyed, I enjoyed the trip. I enjoyed, I enjoyed being with you lot. I mean, it helped that there was quite a few... British boys there and obviously Ali and Anton as well and um, all the all the other guys were so welcoming to me and coach was great um, it was a massive culture shock for sure but mm. it's just like yeah you know what this is this is kind of what I want to do now this is so when I, even when I got back I kind of made the decision that I didn't I wasn't going to go and look for a pro club I thought you know what I've kind of almost had enough of of that game because I saw in the last few years of my career there I saw so many ugly sides of it that it was just I'd, I'd had enough um, it, it became more about who you knew rather than about how good you were um, so I thought you know what let me just take a step back I'll go and join my local club again which was Ascot United at the time um, literally just to for a kickabout for a bit of fun I, did, I, I, did, I didn't get paid didn't get any expenses or anything like that I just thought look, let me come down I'll play a few games I'll keep, keep my eye in a schedule with the Philippines was a little bit, it, it didn't kind of conform to any FIFA windows and stuff. It was like, can you come out? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll come out. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to like have that more of a bit of a focus for me. And, and, you know, I didn't want to be that guy that was going to a pro club, um, a full-time club and kind of having to ask all the time for to be released. Can I go? Can I go? Because that's all I wanted to do then. I knew that that's where I wanted to kind of spend a lot of my time. My, my main focus football-wise was going to be the Philippines. So if you weren't playing pro, how were you making money? I, um, I, I was really into property at the time. So you remember when I said to Jason, I had a, I had a, right. I had a rental property. Um, so that was earning me money. And then I went into business. It just so happened, like at the end of, when I got back from the Philippines, uh, from the Maldives, my mates, I was, I was telling my mate, like, oh, I've just had enough. I've had enough of the game. And, and we had a bit of money floating around. So we said, let's, why don't we try and, and um, have a little bit of a go at this, this property lark. He was a builder at the time. So, yeah, we bought a couple of properties and, and renovated them, did them up and, and flipped them. Um, he would also do little bits of building work and stuff at the time. So that, that was my that was my source of income at the time, like my rental property and, and doing bits and pieces on, on the property with um, my mate. Um, and, that, and it worked well because I was uh, it was something totally different. It was so far away from football that I... Obviously, I'm, I, I missed. There's elements of it, of, of it that I missed, but it was. I've been doing it for a long time, you know. By the time I'd, I'd, um, I'd left Greys, I would, I would have been a pro or like in in the full time environment for about thirteen years, something like that, including my YT and things. So I was like, I was just tired of it. I was tired of that everyday kind of, um, training. So I, I really enjoyed doing, doing, doing the property. And then whenever the national team called me up, I was like, okay, mate, I've got, I've got, got, got to go and leave. He's like, yeah, cool, no problem. I tell Ascot, you know what, guys, I've got to go and got to go on a training camp because training camps back then weren't like a week. They were, they were two or three weeks plus yeah. a tournament on top of it. So um, I think there was one year. I don't know what year it was. Maybe 2010, 2011. I was backwards and forwards between here and the Philippines. So I, I, I worked out, I actually spent six months of the year in the Philippines, but only for like two or three week periods. So I would go and come back and go and come back. But 
you know, that just wouldn't have worked if I had a proper full-time job or a proper full-time club. It just wouldn't have worked. But luckily, it all um, circumstances meant that I could do it. So after that first experience with, uh, with the Ascals, what was the next one? Was it already Suzuki Cup 2010 or is that, is that a little, little bit later on? Uh, a little bit. Did we go to Long Teng? Wasn't there Long Teng or something before that? So, no, so before that, you, you missed out the Des Bullpin, the fabled Des Bullpin era. Okay, so, yeah. uh, with the famous quote, Chris, you'll never play, you'll never play in a Suzuki Cup. That, 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 uh, that quote. Um, yeah. So he lasted, what, one camp and then disappeared. Yeah. I remember uh, I then, went to and get to Cloban with that lot. Like, so none of you lot were there. It was me and, um, um, Jason Arroyo, do you remember? You know him. Yeah, um, he, he lives in now. He lives in now. Oh, does he? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I've seen, I've seen, I follow him on stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was me and him. Like literally, none of you lot were there. Like I don't even think Jimmy. Well, Jimmy and Phil weren't because obviously they fell out with theirs. Um, so yeah, I had a week camp down there into Cloban, and yeah, that was. I think I posted a picture of it a couple of years ago when, well, just when you guys went to. Um, Asian Cups going like this is where this is the transition from from this where I was playing that camp to, to where you guys were playing was it's amazing so yeah there was that there was Long Teng as well I mean that was always a good competition I really enjoyed that going over there to Taiwan um, but yeah like it was it was brilliant I mean but there was no there was nothing in any of those camps in any of those um, tournaments that made you think yeah, in 2010, we're going to, you wait, you wait, well, you wait, Southeast Asia, we're going to tear this up. It was I, like, I, certainly from my point of view, it's like, we'll just go and we'll, you know, we'll try our best and we'll, we'll, we'll graph for each other and all those kind of things. But there was nothing, it wasn't like there was a little spark. I, even before, before the, um, before they like, I wasn't there at the time. I hadn't come out. I don't think you'd come out yet either. But was didn't they play some Thai league team and get absolutely whacked? Yeah, I think it was like nine nil or nine one. Yeah. Or Before all that kicked off, so it kind of didn't bode well. And then, yeah, and then the unbelievable happened. I mean, we, I, I, yeah, we sort of talked about it a little bit, haven't we, Jing? Like we've we've sort of reminisced. Uh, about that competition in various, whether it be interviews or like we've relived the kind of the the, the, the goals or uh, mo memorable moments because we, we've had those podcasts and we, we've managed to kind of revisit those yeah. um, quite a lot, haven't we? But I, I'm guessing, I mean, maybe you do in your mind, but because you're in the UK and I guess no one really cares. Um, so I, I would love to hear your kind of version of events and what you can kind of recall with your hazy memory of, yeah, of that two, 2010 campaign. Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I was a bit like you. you. You always mentioned Jimmy's goal, how underrated that one was um, mm. in the qualifiers. I mean... I mean, it was a big deal for us even in those qualifiers, wasn't it? I mean, you had a really... There's a, there's certain things that I remember about it, like you, you know you had a really really young Maniot in those in that day came to the didn't he come to the qualifiers but not to the main tournament. Yeah, well, if um, Manny was if Manny had gone to the main one, I would never have come out. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember too much about the the qualifiers. Obviously, remember Jimmy's goal um, and how. Uh, as great as your goals, goals were, mate, you're right that Jimmy's goal is massively, massively underrated. It, it was, football's a funny old thing that you could, you could do all these, this is how we're going to try and play and this is what we're going to do. This is, this is, I'd like us to move through the thirds here and get this rotation. That goal that meant so much to Philippine football was just a massive hoik from Neil Etheridge from his own half into the box with Jimmy, a tall lad, got on and flicked it in. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that goal was massive. But then even going out for the tournament, it was, I don't really remember. There was the expectation, there was none. I, I, you know, we just, we were happy to be there. Well, I, from my point of view, it's like, okay, brilliant, we're here. Let's see what we can do. Um, 
let's see. I, I mean, obviously, Mac had come in. Um, the team really kind of picked itself at the time. Um, you know, we had a great we had a great squad support squad, but the starting eleven would probably pretty much pick itself. Um, you know, we we were playing together for 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 quite a while before that, so we knew each other inside out. We knew we had a lot of heart. We knew we had a we were we were able to graft after stuff. But I can't I can't tell you why all, all of a sudden it all just fell magically into place for that. For that tournament, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we were massively backs against the wall for the Singapore game. Managed to go and nick something. Um, it it was one of those that I think that they weren't necessarily expecting anything from us, Singapore. So their probably guard down was a little bit. We put up a bit of resistance. And then it kept to, it probably starts to get to the point where you're in the second half and you're probably about an hour into the game and you're still you're riding your luck a little bit and you you start to look around and you're thinking it might be our day today you know like it might it might just be our day because it like we've all had them like we've all had those games where you've been back to the wall and you're you know you're not having a great game and everything in normal footballing world would mean that the opposition will win eventually. You know, they, you know what they would have been saying. They would have been saying, you know, keep going guys. We'll get our opportunity. We'll break eventually. Just keep knocking on the door. Eventually it'll happen for us. But then on the same side, as this time goes on, it's like, Ooh, yeah, maybe they start thinking, oh, maybe we won't get that goal. Maybe that, maybe it's not going to be our day. Hang on a minute. And then we start getting a bit of confidence and then, and then up someone pops with a nice little goal at the end. And I mean, that, that I remember that kind of, that euphoria was just, I can't, I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it now. It's just, it was, it was, it was an unbelievable, unbelievable experience. And then to go from that to the, to the next game again. So now you've got a little bit of momentum. Now you've got a little bit of belief. Now you've got the crowd, which, which always brings a little bit more out of you. Like, I don't know if you've, you've seen the, um, I remember walking out that day um, and um, on the video actually that's there on YouTube, because I, I was walking in front of Anton and um, I remember like, like you'll see me walking out and I'm smiling because it's just because Anton's just shouting, he's ho- like just being such an, <laughs> such an American guy, just like, whoa, yeah, man, this is amazing. <laughs> Ooh, come on guys i would never forget it and he was just going yeah baby yeah come on all this kind of stuff and i just that sort of just made me smile i just i remember walking out and like he's right though it kind of pumped you up that little bit more we had a little bit of confidence from the game before um and yeah another one of those games where in in the normal footballing world we had no right to win neil was pulling out some of the most unbelievable saves I think I've ever seen. Um, I've made a couple of blocks. I remember making a couple of big blocks at the time, um, massively backs against the wall. And then, yeah, up pops Mr. Great, which again, one off his shoulder. And it was off his shoulder. And... Um, yeah, and then the other goal. The other goal was brilliant, by the way. I mean, I, I think Ian Ian, Ian Araneta's contribution to that goal is, almost gets passed by. Like his vision and the way he picked someone out was brilliant. So, um, yeah, Chris's touch as well inside the field was pretty good. I must admit. So, um, yeah, and then the, the, the so the explosion of euphoria was probably more for the more for the Singapore game because it was that last minute explosion if you like when Phil scored then it's kind of like the second game it's that was when okay we can kind of enjoy this a little bit I think they hit the bar like late on I'm yeah. pretty sure that they hit the bar late on um, but it was it was almost more of a there was a more of a calming euphoria around it um, so yeah, I mean that, that's the that's my other obviously my Suzuki Suzuki Cup shirt behind me as well, and yeah, that, that I mean those that that period in my career was was just 
one that I'll never ever forget. It was amazing. Final whistle. Neil, Neil comes running over to me. <clears throat> like my favourite one is um, it's where Boogie is just on his knees praying. I mean, it was it was. I get emotional talking about it. It was amazing. Everybody seems to say it's off the shoulder, Chris. <laughs> I can't believe he, he's 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 really opened up about that, and then you just bring it back to the shoulder again. I don't care, whatever. You know, if people <laughs> want to make out of my shoulder, they can they can say what they want. But uh, no, I mean it's 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 funny when you hear the different accounts or the different yeah. things that stand uh, stand out for certain individuals. You know, like I don't know if you heard Jing's recollection of it. You know, it was it, the thing that stands out with his recollection is him going home drunk on his. Uh, on his mm -hmm. longboard, is that right? Do you know what is it? Is it longboard, yeah. right? You had at the time or yeah. something, you know. And it's for me, it's like everyone's account is different and unique in its own way. And um, you know, it's there's different things that resonate with different individuals that that makes it special. And um, you know, even though we've had different accounts of the same games, it's always from a different lens or a different perspective. So it's always really interesting when you you get someone reliving that seminal moment those those sort of pivotal times in in uh in philippine football and and yeah it's it's really nice then to, to hear such a glowing account of those games because at the end of the day like that like you said it's the singapore game was probably more euphoric wasn't it, it was, well our scores are, <laughs> for me for me it certainly was um but we kind of knew right well it, 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 that's it we, we, we got the draw it was the, almost the last kick of the game, whereas the Vietnam game was like, it was like a slow realisation, almost mm -hmm. of like, oh my gosh, we're going to win this. And that was, a, that was a, after maybe like 80 minutes. I'm like, we're going to win this. And for 10 minutes, I'm literally jogging around going, they're not going to score. Like, they're not going to yeah. pull this back. Like, that, that game honestly could have gone on for another 30 minutes, another hour, two hours, and I still don't think they would have scored. Like, it was just one of those days where we would have done whatever it took to ensure that we got those, uh, got that three points and, and yeah, ultimately qualification out of that, out of that group, which at the time seems ludicrous because Singapore, I mean, you, we can't really underestimate how good Singapore were at that time. I mean, they, they, they won at either side of those two competitions. Right. Um, so, so Vietnam had just, Vietnam were the reigning champion, sorry. And the host, yeah, right. and, and then, uh, and then Singapore had won at the previous tournament and then the subsequent tournament. So these guys were no mugs. They were, they were strong, strong teams. So for us to go in and, and qualify out that group was no mean feat. But really, I mean... I, a lot, I, a lot I of remember... People... Sorry, Chris. I just remember as well... Because you, you... Yes, it was euphoric. And I remember, obviously, that I was, that I was celebrating after the game and stuff. I remember in the... Um, after the... Um, I think it was the Vietnam game. I, I was absolutely spent... I remember just like in the shower after the game. I remember I had to go and get a, um, I had to go and get a chair and sit down. And, like so, I put the chair in the shower and just let the shower just rain on me because I was absolutely spent. And, and kind of what what people forget is that, you know, you have those moments. That the, the game takes it out of you. The moment then takes it out of you. But then you've got to go and do it again like two days later. And then so the same to get so you. you Yes, you, you're kind of buzzing and you, you, your emotions are going all over the place. But then you go, kind of get back to the hotel and you're having a chat and, and whatever. And you, 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 then your focus starts going on, right, I need to refuel. We need to, we've got another game to go here. So, you, mm. you know, that kind of, that change in mindset is, you know, it, that was really tough, I think. That's why probably the last game that the performance was professional, but it wasn't. Like, you know, we didn't, we were, we wouldn't have said it was a, like a classic ASCAL performance. It was just no. to get the job done, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's quite underrated as well, that performance. I mean, there's no footage really that's floating around. It was a nil-nil ball draw. But mm. like you said, it, it wasn't a formality that we qualified. You know, no. it, it, the, I mean, the results went our way in the other game anyway. But, you know, if, if we, had we not have picked up the, the point, you know, we, we, all, all of that hard work would have been for nothing. So... Um, you know, I think that was quite a professional performance in retrospect. When you think about what um, you know, what we had to do to get that job that, that job done, and uh, and ultimately lead us to that showdown game with with Indonesia. Um, obviously, for, like from my personal perspective, I felt that everything changed 
in that sort of window between the group stage and then that Suzuki Cup mm. semi final clash. Like what what can you remember from from that? I mean, there, there's certain things that some people have talked about in, in previous episodes, but what what what's your sort of main recollection from from those <laughs> two semi finals? Um well I so there was a lot of stuff going on in my in like me and my missus, but my wife, there was a lot of stuff going on like before before that tournament as well, um, at home. So there was a point where I was even like on the day of, of flying out um for the tournament itself, the, the the main part of the tournament, that I was unsure whether I was coming or not. Um, you know, there's there was a couple of things that had happened over here um that was really, really tough to deal with. Right. Really, really tough to deal with. And so I, I was obviously when they came out and I played in that tournament. Um, and then I don't, you remember Emma came out, my wife came out to Indonesia yeah. after that. Um, and I'll be, you know, forever grateful for, to Mr. Palami for, for letting her and, and Maka as well. Cause you know, she, they, they let her come out at a time that was really, really tough for, for like a, as a family, it was really, really difficult. And, um, they let they let Emma come out. So then, my obviously after the after the tournament, my then focus was on trying to get her out. And she came out to Manila for a bit, and then came over to Indonesia as well. Stayed and watched mm. the first game, and then flew back after that. But um, you know that was that was a tough, tough, tough time. And um, she she was amazing through the whole thing. Um, and like I say, I just thank Mr. Palami and, and Maka for, for letting her come out because it could quite easily, like it probably wouldn't happen nowadays if someone said, you, you know, do you mind if my missus comes out because, you know, it's circumstance, circumstances around it. Um, I never, I never knew that. Yeah. Knew so that. that's, that, that's why Emma came out because there was, yeah, stuff happened at home and, um, uh, I won't go into the details of it, but she, it was it was touch and go whether I was going to come out to the tournament at all itself. And um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So so Emma came out, and um, so that was amazing. And then my mum and dad actually came out to Indonesia as well in there. So Ems was there to watch the first game, which was brilliant with my mum mm. and dad. Um, you know, there's probably a handful of, of Filipinos in that stadium, and then that was, you know, you kind of you, your whole career is is you. I found I always find with football you're always chasing that moment. You're always chasing these moments. You know, you're chasing these euphoric moments of of winning a league or winning a title or or getting that chasing that rush of a, a goal, last minute goal against Singapore or you know that's that's the drug, that's the adrenaline that goes along with with professional sport. And you're always chasing it because there's a lot of flipping lows throughout your career. There's definitely something that I try to tell the girls that there's, there will be more low moments in your career than there will be highs. I always feel like you're trying to chase those highs. And then that period in, in that 2010 was almost like the culmination of, of a lot of years of hard work where we get the opportunity to play on that stage um, with a group of lads that was... <laughs> You know, we we were we were grafters. We were technically all okay, but like I said to you before, like on form books, and we had probably no right to be there. Um, but we, through sheer grit and determination, and and I don't know what else, we managed to to get to that moment. Was like to have that opportunity. I feel so blessed to have been able to play in that stadium. Uh, and in in that circumstance, it was it was it was an amazing amazing time, and we we just fell short. We, we we just fell short, but I think you know all the all the accolades and everything that came after it as a result of that were were fully warranted because the boys, the staff, not just the one to eleven on the pitch, but all the guys that played their part in that in that tournament. But I remember playing head tennis with with all the guys at the at the. Um, at the, what was the name of the hotel? The Sultan. Mm. You know, we would we would go and do a like a cool down session after training or whatever. We'd play tennis on a tennis court with the football with all the boys. Like the camaraderie was just the best it's ever been. Uh, there were a couple of practical jokes with Neil and stuff, and along the way, and it, it, you know, the whole experience was just you know 
that's why it's on the wall because I, you know, they're the only, they're literally the only three bits of football in the memorabilia that I've got up around the house, and um, the other one there is just me being like captain in the team in Manila for the first time. Um, yeah, they're they're the moments that you kind of live for. That's why you do. That's why you do the sport that you do. Is that the pinnacle quite... for you? Sorry. No, no, no. I was going to ask. This, I was going to ask pretty much the same thing, Jing. So go ahead. Yeah, was that was that the pinnacle for you? Um, obviously, there's six more years of your career with the Ascals, and things have changed. Your profile is through the roof, and uh, more different. Uh, you know, more tournaments, different personalities come in and out. Um, obviously, you were a mainstay for the next six years within um, the team. But did you think that 2010 and that experience in particular was the peak? For you like i say you're always so it, after that after that happened and after you know it, stories like that don't happen very often you know leicester city winning the league winning the premier league for example you know st- like fairy tales like that don't happen very often um and there a certain certain extent you always felt i mean there were some massive massive moments between between then and when i retired you know huge huge moments um, iconic moments, but you always feel like you're chasing that as well, as well. Like you, you it, like I say, it's a drug. It, that that kind of euphoric moment of just that it would. It just wasn't the single game. It was the whole. I don't know how however long we were away. What has it been? About a month, probably, mm. from start to finish. Perhaps you know the whole the whole time was just perfect. Um, obviously, we wanted to try and do better in, the, in get through to the final. I would have said that probably was the pinnacle. It was. It was my. It, it, I, I, it's a moment that I'll always look back on, always, even now, and I, I'll get. I will get emotional about talking about it because it was. <clears throat> it was um, probably what I went through as well as a, as a family leading up to that. I would have thought. Um, it was. Yeah, for me, it was. It was probably the pinnacle of my career. Yeah, that whole that whole tournament, not just the any one game, the whole the whole part of the month long process as, as a whole was it was amazing is it similar for you chris uh i'd have to say yeah um probably maybe for different reasons to rob obviously um but when i when uh, i'd probably been around for a lot longer than rob so i'd, I'd sort of seen it because he did experienced it for maybe one or two training camps where it's been sort of, yeah, dealing with crummy fields and, you know, poor organization and all that kind of stuff. But I'd been doing that for since I think 2004. So I've had six years of that. And for me, it was I think maybe because it was a longer process. I'd been involved with it for a longer period of time that it meant that, you know, when it does finally all come together, it was, it was that, um, that realization that we'd actually accomplished something that we threatened to do on many occasions, or we talked about, oh, you know, if this guy was available, if that guy could make it, or oh, if we just got a good goalkeeper, and then we've got a good goalkeeper, oh, if we just got a good centre back. And then invariably it always just seemed to fall short for whatever reason, someone couldn't fly out or someone couldn't make it. Um, and like Rob said, it was there were no indicators that it was going to be any different for that competition. So, you know, but the expectations just weren't there. Um, which, which I think even adds to the um, to how special it was because it, it, thereafter there was there was massive expectation on us. You know, if you take the the next Suzuki Cup campaigns, we still qualified for the semi final for each of the next two. Didn't make it for the following one, and then again this this past Suzuki Cup. So, in three of the last four since the 2010 uh, Suzuki Cup, we, we qualified for the semi finals, but none of them seem to have had that same sort of. Um, mystique or, or uh, you know, as, as, as Rob alluded to, sort of fairy tale elements to it. It, it, it all kind of changed after that particular campaign. So, um, yeah, for, for me, just being part of that process, I would say it was, it, was, it was probably the pinnacle of my career also, but more so, I think, for maybe for, for sort of different reasons. Um, the only thing that I can really think of, I don't know how you feel about this, Rob, where I had a similar kind of feeling in terms of the camaraderie and in terms of um, uh, team spirit 
was was probably the Maldives competition, the the Challenge Cup qualifiers that we had. I think um, that's probably the only one that I can think of that that that, that kind of came close. Um, I don't know if you have the same opinion or not, but that was that was one for me that had a similar kind of it had those sort of Suzuki Cup 2010 elements and components to it. Um, certainly from a camaraderie and uh, team spirit standpoint. Yeah, I'll probably go along with that. Like you say, that it, it comes down to expectation from outside sources as well. So <clears throat> we were probably expected to do all right in that tournament. Even in ourselves as a team, we, we would have looked at that tournament and thought, you know what, we've got a good chance here for this. Looking around at the squad that we had, I mean, that squad was absolutely stacked, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, was, maybe the best. One of the best, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I mean, when you're leaving Jerry Lewis Centre out for your final, that's when you know your squad's stacked. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Neil's um, not starting. Yeah, Neil's, Neil's not, not starting. Um, so, yeah, but the, I agree that the camaraderie around that tournament was, um, yeah, right up there. I look back at my time at Aldershot when we won the league as well. The camaraderie around the team was, was similar. You, you with that camaraderie as well, you, you get a certain amount of arrogance that comes out with it, your, your team performance. Um, like with those games in that Challenge Cup, in the Challenge Cup, I, I I walked onto the pitch thinking we'll probably win today, or you know, you know, we won't, we're not going, we're not coming out here to get battered. You know, we're gonna, you lot are gonna have to be on your on your game to beat us today. That's mm. how I felt going into that tournament. Just because mm. we were stacked, um, I really felt that we were. I mean, that's a bit of a regret, really, that we did win that tournament. But uh, the same was when I was at Aldershot when we won the league. It was we we would go out to every game. We we won the we won the league over a hundred points, I think, that year. And we would go out into every game thinking, you know what, we'll win today, and that's the difference. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd probably go along with that, Chrissy. I'd, the difference is obviously the expectation from the team within, and the, the perception from people at home as well that they were expecting us to win. I think, or at least at least put in a really strong showing in that tournament. Is it one of your biggest disappointments <laughs> that we didn't qualify for Asian Cup? Um, yeah, yeah. Like the the final was a huge, huge disappointment. Um. That and um, the Suzuki Cup, where we lost to Singapore as well, where we got to Yeah, I really felt that we would have got to final on that one. Uh, we, you know, we, we, was it, it was nil nil at home, wasn't it? It was a draw, yeah. the home game. Yeah. That's, um, and then I thought, you know, that's another regret, really, that, that we didn't. We couldn't just find it, find that extra little bit to get us to a final. I mean, I would have loved to have got to a final, like yeah. qualified for the Asian Cup for the other one, or got to the final of Suzuki Cup for 2012 for sure. Yeah. It, what was I it mean, like for you? Oh, sorry, yeah. Chris, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Jing. No, I was just, I, I'm just curious, you know, obviously there's a bit of the disappointment there uh, of not being able to qualify for the Asian Cup, but, you know, a few years down the road, what's it like seeing the Philippines? make that jump, make that leap. And I, I was looking back at some of your tweets and, and, and saying that, you know, it's, it's Ven Erickson who's, who's there leading the team out. That's, it's all a bit bizarre and all a bit uh, almost, it's too fairy tale like you know what I mean, that we're actually on that stage. What was it like for you to, to see that, um, obviously from a distance now, um, not being a part of the team? Yeah, it's... Um... It's it's weird to be honest. It's weird because you you miss it. You miss you, you, you when you retire. You miss you miss playing. Like I remember when when I was when I was a youngster coming up, and then you had all the old guys telling you in the change room, oh, make sure you enjoy your career because it will be over before you know it." Like, it, it, and you used to, at that time you think, "Oh yeah, do." Once this is, I'll be doing this for ages. Yeah, I'll, I'm cool. Like, but it really is. You do really have to enjoy because it it's in, over in the blink of an eye. And and so when you when I was viewing those games and that whole campaign, you view it as a fan. Obviously, I, I'm a, I'm a football fan that wants my team to do well. I've got a lot of mates involved in that, so you're obviously wanting success for everyone. Uh, but it's tinged with um. 
an element of jealousy because you want to be part of it. And it's, 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 that's something that everyone has to live with when you retire is people are now able to do things that you really, really still want to be able to do, but can't do it. Um, you know, kind of I'm probably go off on a bit of a tangent here, but it's, it's, that's when, when people do eventually retire, that's, it's, it's a tough point in your, in your life to be able to, to deal with that, to have to figure out how to deal with it. Cause Yes, obviously, I was I was ecstatic that the team got to the final and uh, got to the finals, qualified. I mean, in such like unbelievable circumstances as well. Um, but it is tinged. There's a, so you, you're really happy about it from that element, but there's a part of you that's like that's a bit deflated by it because you want to be part of it, and you're you're essentially you're you're jealous of people doing what you used to be able to do and you can't do it anymore. And I don't want that to sound like, um, um, like come across as selfish or anything, but it's just, it's just part of the, the mental aspect of retirement that, that everyone's going to have to deal with. And I'm okay with it. I'm okay with, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I know that that was, um, I know how to deal with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay with saying that, um, I was jealous about people that were involved in that that situation, just because I, I wanted to be involved in it as well, and because I was involved in it at some point. And um, yeah, so when when you do retire, when people eventually retire, it, it's tough because you you're known as it's you're known as Rob the footballer, you're known as Chris the footballer. When people see you, it's like, oh, how, how's football going? It'll be the first thing that people ask you constantly. How's football going? Oh. I, you're not playing anymore. Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Or how'd you get on at the weekend? Or that's what you are. So you, you struggle to find a little bit of your identity in the, in the early years of retirement. And you can see why so many people struggle with their mental health around that kind of time. Um, I don't know if you, if you felt similar, Chris, but um, at all. I mean, I, I was quite fortunate, Rob, because I went, I, I transitioned quite, quickly because I was basically as a player and then I was player manager and then I was manager. So when you sort of look at that transition, I was still able to have um, uh, a transition that enabled me to stay within the game. Um, You know, I would hate, I would hate to have been an outsider looking in on that um, Asian Cup qualification game. I would have hated to be on the outside. So I was really thankful that I was able to have the opportunity to be on the coaching staff and, um, and, and have some sort of influence on, on a game of that magnitude. Because if, if for me personally, like if I probably similar to you, Rob, if I had been part of so many big moments in Philippine football history, um, to not been a part of something as big as that would have, I, I probably had the same reaction as you, to be perfectly honest. Um, but, you know, thankfully, obviously, you know, Thomas Dooley and uh, and I had, a, I think, a, a decent relationship, and he asked me to be part of the coaching staff, and it enabled me to to, you know, have some some influence and have some say in in, in that qualification campaign, and obviously, staying staying on for the Asian Cup was was great as well. Um, but no, my <coughs> transition was probably a little less um, less abrupt as yours, and, and obviously being still around the football scene here in the Philippines has enabled me to stay in contact with that. Um, mm. For you, I'd imagine it'd be quite difficult because it, it's 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 a severance of ties almost because yeah, you're you're the other side of the world and you, you, you don't have any influence or impact really other than you know conversations like you're having with us here, where you get an opportunity to relive and recount some of those great opportunities and like you said I, I can see that being very difficult for for someone like yourself um and rob's um uh, sorry neil's talked about this a lot in uh in, in his podcast you know the fact that he in moments where you think it, they should you should be euphoric you should be ecstatic you know how it was almost a sense of when they got promoted to the premier league like well, am i going to be and am i going to be starting in the premier league and am i going to be I'm going to be playing in the Premier League, you know, am I good enough to play in the Premier League? All of these other sorts of things come to the surface. So, um, you know, I, I totally get where you're coming from with that. It, it's, it's, I can imagine it being very conflicting because there's always going to be an element of, oh God, I wish I was, I wish I was there. I wish I was a part of it. And, um, you know, I'm sure if the, the national team 
continues to progress and continues to do well. I'll, I'll have those moments, um, you know, at, at some point down the line. But no, I, I, I totally get where you're coming from, and it's it's difficult to not feel conflicted because ultimately you, you, you feel part of it, don't you? And um, mm. you want to be part of it. It's very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. I totally, I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah, I mean, f- football in general is is like Neil said in his podcast. There's so many elements of, of football and probably professional sport as well, where you know, if you think about it, since I joined, since I was a schoolboy at Wimbledon, you are constantly judged every single step of the way for everything that you do. So you're, am I good enough? Um, um, have I done enough to, have I done enough in this game? Um, what does the coach think of me? Um, you know, you're constantly, constantly. And then when you start playing in the, in this, in the first team, when you, when you eventually make your debut, it's, Every single game is you're judged. You're judged. People have their opinions on you. Um, so it's a hard, hard industry. People don't realise. You, you see all the glamorous side of the game. But it's you, your ups and downs are, are, are huge. Like your peaks and troughs throughout your career is, is massive. And I always give the, bit, the best bit of advice I ever got was you can never let yourself. If you ride the peaks and the troughs, and you get really high when you win and you get really low when you when you lose or you don't have a good game, you're going to burn out double quick. You, you need to be able to maintain that kind of, um, that level where, okay, you can go up and down a little bit, but you can't be riding it up and down. You have to be going straight. You have to be kind of keeping yourself as level headed as you possibly can. Cause the game will, the game throws so much at you. Um, and like I say, you are constantly, constantly judged. Um, so when that, when that's all over and when that finishes, um i'm a little bit different as well because my knees are really bad so like i can't um i get i get a lot of pain on my knees now um thankfully like day-to-day stuff and coaching and stuff is fine but i can't at the moment probably why i miss football even more is that i can't i can't go out and have a five a side on a regular basis i can't really? go and have really? a out. yeah my, my knee i can do one and then my knee will be sore for like two or three two weeks and it'll be like oh, really? yeah yeah and it, is that is that really worth it to play that one five aside so you know I, I can't it's not strong enough to to do like perfect demos all the time and things like that so it's frustrating like you know that's the cruel thing about retirement I suppose and getting older is that you have so much more knowledge and um, understanding of the game and technically and tactically and everything that you know, if you were, if your body was now twenty one again, you you'd be a hell of a player. Now, I'm sure you, all of us would be, but that's the cruel reality of of, of getting that little bit older. And and it, all, all that stuff is this stuff that you've got to get used to, and and you've got to you just got to accept it, and you've got to be okay with it. And um, for some people, that's easier, and some people, that's a little bit more difficult. But thankfully, I found my kind of I found my my solace now in 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 coaching and in, and in what I do now. And, um, you know, I get huge, huge enjoyment out of, out of what I do now. So, so thankfully I found, I found, I found my little, my little area. I, um, I don't have that problem, Rob. I'm still amazing at demos. If I'm being quite frank, <laughs> I, I, um, I, I'm thinking about coming, making a comeback. So yeah, yeah there's any there agents out the, there, let me know. There was a question that I saw one of the questions on Facebook. Someone said, do you want a, one last hurrah? I was thinking, ah, oh, man, that's, that's off the cards. That is not, no. that is not on the table <laughs> for me. You, you, you know what, Rob? I, I want to be respectful of your time because we've, we've, we've. I said that maybe an hour. We've, we've waffled on probably for the best part too. Um, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sure there might be a couple of questions. If you have enough time, so you can do a couple of the questions yeah, look, from the audience. That would be, that would be great. Um, Boise, feel your boots, man. I'm, I'm in isolation here, so whatever you want. Like, <laughs> my day is. Like I've got not got anything else to do. It keeps me away from I, home. I, I just think it's yeah. <laughs> I mean, just just in terms of the interview, um, Rob. Like I think that was a really nice way to bring it back to the beginning. Obviously, we talked about your coaching career at the start. Um, you know, it's 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 really nice for you to to talk about your, um, you know, how your experiences as a player have influenced you um, in terms of how. Um, you interact with your players in, in, in terms of your coaching and your philosophy and stuff. So I think that that's great. Um, and, and for you to bring it back in the interview and, and, and 
in in that way, I think was really, really nice and a fitting way to um, bring that portion of the interview to a close. Like just from my perspective, I know we, we spoke about this a lot in, in, in previous podcasts, whether it be about my Ascal 11 or, um, you know, just in conversations that we've had. And I, I know Shrocky spoke about it probably most glowingly was the fact that, you know, one, one of the things that will forever stay with me and be an eternal memory of mine is the best moment for me in any game was always the huddle either before the kickoff or in the change room before we went out for our walkout. It was always the best moment. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact, you, I don't know if you know this or not, but I know now because I went in as a coach and I would speak to some of these players, you know, Patrick Reichel, um, Shrocky, and they tell all of these guys, these young guys coming through, be like, oh my gosh, you should hear Rob's team talks before the games. Mm -hmm. And they, and they talk about it like, and, and you know, you talk about the goosebumps with certain moments that you've had in the game. Um, but they were, I remember b being in a, in a room with uh, Shrocky and Reichel and they were saying like, oh my gosh, like, you know, before the game, like, you know, sometimes you don't feel a hundred percent or you might be at a tournament and it's tight, you're tired and you spend all this time, you're away from your family. And then Rob brings out this, you know, we're doing this for the Cabobians or we're doing this for our family at home. And then, straight away you snap into game mode and you realize why you're there i think one of those you know the, the football can come and go like i, I can take it i can leave it. It, it it's it's there's other things that you that you really miss and um you know speaking from my perspective and i know that this is the perspective of a lot of the other players who played alongside you rob is you know we we really miss those moments because i think when it when it all comes down to it you know, those are the things that make your football career so special and so unique. So, um, you know, we don't really have the chance to talk to you about these sort of things because footballers are supposed to be men and they're, you know, macho and they don't talk about these sorts of things. But, you know, just from my perspective as a, as a good friend of yours, it's not just me who feels that way. It's a lot of other people who played alongside you and they, they probably haven't had the chance to thank you. But, you know, some of those, you know, biggest moments were off the back of some you know, incredible motivational speeches or, um, you know, conversation that you've had with players before the game. Um, and that's led us to achieve things that were unthinkable to, um, to the general football public or to, to people from the outside. So um, I, for one, would just like to say, you know, massive, massive thank you because um, I don't think you fully appreciate or understand how impactful those, those moments were. And, um, yeah, I, I'm sure if the other guys have a chance or if you ever come back to the Philippines, I know it's been a while, I, I'm sure that a lot of those people will, will say the same thing. So um, I just want to say thank you because that's, um, that's a oh, massive, you, massive mate. reason for it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, mate. No, that, I, I enjoyed that. I mean, that, I love that. That's, that's one thing you miss, isn't it? It's the being in the, being in the change room with the guys and it's, yeah, they're, they're the elements that, like you say, the football kind of comes and goes a little bit. But those those moments of those that you share with your teammates are they're always special. And I never I had an idea what I would be saying in in certain certain moments, but a lot of that just comes out, and it's just it's just natural. So I know that means a lot, mate. Stir, thanks a lot. He's a very good speaker, Rob. If he wasn't a footballer, he could be a politician if he wanted to be. I'm not sure if that's his thing, but uh, I uh, can see him on the circuit, you know, doing those motivational speeches, uh, you know, selling a lifestyle, something like that, if he wasn't a good footballer. But, uh, just you know, waffle, those, mate. Just waffle. Yeah, maybe it is. But, no, it was definitely ha uh, hair on the back of your neck type stuff. So, yeah, thank you, mate. I really appreciate that. Um uh, Jing, have you got what, what questions came in? Any any, any sort of uh, elements that we didn't touch upon in, in, in the interview that the fans and the viewers would uh, would like answered? Yeah, actually, we've got a whole bunch of questions, too many, in fact, to run through as of the moment. Um, so uh, I just want to say thank you to Rob for giving us the time uh, to to have this conversation. It's been a real treat for me personally as a, as a fan of Philippine football to have the opportunity and, um, you know, a lot of people will have fond memories to take with them. And, and, and you are a focal point in a lot of them. And um, I'm sure they've enjoyed this conversation. So uh, thank you for the time. And, um, 
this is how we'll close this one, I think. And if, if it's all right with you, we'll, we'll have a, a, a few moments to, 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 to look through some of these questions. There's, there's a lot of them. I mean, a lot of people were very excited about you coming <laughs> on the show. So, um, you know, there's some of them are, are just quick one-liners perhaps that you can answer. The rest of them, if you'd like to um, expound on, then you can do that. But um, for this episode oh, on Rob Gear, um, we'll draw it to a close. So again, thanks, Rob. Um, absolute legend for the Philippine Ascals and uh, a real example for everybody to follow. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Cheers, mate. Thank you.